while we are quite away. As you now know now that all these uh, talks and all the proceedings will be recorded. Therefore, uh, if anybody missed out, can listen or listen later on. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So we can start now. Dr. Jain, can, can you start the ball rolling for us? Dr. Jain, can you start? Yeah, I think we should. Uh, we can start now. We are ready. Uh, I think. Vilas ready with his slides, I think, and we can get, get started. Okay. Can you start with Dr. Jain's opening remarks, please? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Ray. <clears throat> Good afternoon and seasons. <clears throat> seasons greetings to all the distinguished members of the medical fraternity gathered here today on this web platform under the auspices of the Indian chapter of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland. <clears throat> today, I am reminded of what a wise teacher had once said, you know, he said, the human mind is like a parachute. It works only when it is open. I am grateful to the regional advisor and chairman of the Indian chapter of the RCPI, Dr. Sabisachi Ray, and vice chairman, Dr. M. K. Mukhopadhyay and Dr. Sujay Mazundar for inviting me to this ICRCPI webinar. The clinical topics which we have to deal with in our day-to-day -day work. Before proceeding further, a few words on the MRCPI postgraduate qualification. For all of you, whether you're medical students, interns, resident doctors, postgraduate trainees, or physicians, if you wish to carve out a bright future in clinical medicine, the ultimate goal ought to be the MRCPI, that is the membership of the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland, which is recognized recognized around the world as an international benchmark of excellence in medicine, opening up new opportunities for career advancement. By successfully completing the MRCPI examination, you are joining a global network of respected physicians whose roots date back to the year 1654. It also sets you on the pathway to fellowship of the Royal College which is a career milestone in itself and an international benchmark of professional excellence. 
Our fellows are experienced hospital consultants who have made substantial contributions to their specialty. Globally, we have around over 11,000 fellows, members, licentiates, and trainees in more than 80 countries. Today, we are in the midst of a mind-boggling age of unending information, knowledge, and technological ferment. Sadly, more information and more knowledge always undermines common sense and ancient wisdom. More information does not make one happy and healthy. On the contrary, we will we face more stress in day-to-day -day life today. We have more lifestyle diseases like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, psychosomatic and psychiatric illnesses, and tough-to-treat infections caused by the superbugs, along with a plethora of other uncommon conditions. Therefore, webinars like this one are the need of the hour for disseminating and sharing practical knowledge and wisdom amongst us clinicians so as to equip us to face the challenging clinical situation we face in a balanced and effective manner. On our academic platter today, we have three interesting dishes. Number one is a preferred antihypertensive drug in comorbidities and specific conditions on which we have a very good speaker, Dr. Vilash Tiwari, who is a consultant physician and director of the Sai Healthcare Hospital in Mumbai. This talk is being chaired by none other than Dr. Sumit Acharya, consultant cardiologist of the Ruby General Hospital, Kolkata. The second talk is management of sepsis by Dr. Kaushik Ghosh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the Murshidabad Medical College. And this talk is being chaired by Dr. Sudip Subodip Pal, consultant physician and critical care specialist of the AM AMRI Hospital, that is the Amri Hospital in Kolkata. Finally, we have uh, a talk by Dr. M.K. Mukhopadhyay, who is consultant endocrinologist at the AMRI Hospital, Kolkata. He will speak on an upstream approach to address the weight of diabetics with the newer drug, oral semiglutide. And this talk is being cheered by Dr. Sujoy Mazumdar, consultant endocrinologist hospital and the GD Diabetic Hospital, Kolkata. Finally, we will have the pleasure of closing remarks and a vote of thanks by fellow FRCPI, Dr. S.K. Gopalka, who is a member of the Indian or chapter of the RCPI. I wish you all a very fruitful and enriching webinar. And I will now conclude with some words, words of wisdom by Tirthankar Mahavir, who said, the only good is knowledge and the only evil is ignorance. I think we can start today's talk. I invite uh, Dr. Vilash Tiwari to speak on hypertension. Thank you. Before, before that, I just like to have a few, if I give you a few words about Indian chapter. Thank you, Dr. Jain, for such an excellent introduction. And <clears throat> I just wanted to say about this Indian chapter, which was actually formed in 2005, officially inaugurated. And from then on, we started conducting MRCPI part one examination, the next year part two examination, followed by clinical examination from 2007 onwards. Apart from the examination, we have been organizing CMEs and academic programs by ourselves and in association with international and national organization of India and the neighboring states. And we have been continuing this quite successfully until the COVID came up and then we resorted to the webinars and since we are still continuing on that, and with I, we, we is one of them, and it's been very rewarding for us. And I think with that few words, I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Jain again to con to moderate the sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I now invite Dr. Avilash Tiwari uh, to go ahead with this talk. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, thank you, Jen, sir, Dr. Sabdis Achiri, sir, and all the committee members for giving me this an opportunity to deliver my talk. Uh, Mr. Devashaji, can you please uh, share the slides? Uh, to begin with, first and foremost, as what Dr. Jen has rightly said, I think this talk has been heard by all clinicians, students, 
and students of all the ages. It's beautifully said by Dr. Jain sir in an era of information overload, I can say. As per the pub medicine, uh, the last year we have uh, citations that around 5,000 new publications have been published every year. And if a doctor decides from the internal medicine to keep him updated, going through all the, going, uh, through all the updated uh, citations and the abstracts, even if he doesn't sleep, it is not possible for him to finish these many updates by the year. And by the next year, the new updates are there. As a clinician, uh, we should be very practical, pragmatic, and precision-based approach has to be incorporated in our practice that which patient required what type of treatment. And does my new intervention or my new approach was going to bring about a definitely we're going to bring about a good and positive outcome in overall the health status of the patient in terms of mortality, in terms of morbidity, and above all, the quality of life. Uh, with this, I just want to start my topic. Hypertension drugs and comorbidities. There are a lot of new research, new updates, new practical guidelines have come and how can we incorporate this in our routine practice? That is what my talk is all about. Today, I'm going to deliver. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. So, Making the diagnosis of the hypertension, yeah. Friends, uh, to begin this today's talk, yeah, I just want to emphasize the few important thing about the management of the hypertension and choosing an appropriate drug for a given clinical condition. That is what I'm gonna talk. The most important thing about the management of the hypertension consisting of the three important aspects. Number one is making the accurate diagnosis of the hypertension. Number two, Assessing the atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk factors and to screen the individual whether the patient is at what level or has an established target organ and organ damage. And third important thing, to see if an, any secondary cause of the hypertension. I do agree with the point that the secondary hypertension uh, is quite rare and often it is surgically correctable as what we know. But let me tell you one thing, there are certain secondary causes of the hypertension, even after surgically removing those causes of the hypertension, the hypertension may remain persistent. Yes, they may remain persistent. For example, if you cut off the adrenal tumors, or if you remove or overcome bilateral renal artery stenosis, there are certain subsets of the cases which who continues to have the hypertension. And next very important thing which I want to emphasize here is when we say the patient to have a lifestyle modification, which is the cornerstone, the pillar of the management of the hypertension. Once the patient defines into the stage one of the hypertension, these lifestyle maneuvers are often inadequate and patients should be encouraged to, on a particular drug regimen irrespective of his age, race, or ethnic background. And it should be re-emphasized and reinforced in every visit the patient should take an optimal amount of drug so as to achieve a particular target that what we're going to discuss. So the making a diagnosis of the hypertension, assessing the atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk factor. Next slide. And also looking for the target and organ damage. It is very important. When the patient comes to your clinic, just do an ECG to see an evident ischemic heart disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, and to look for the secondary cause of the hypertension. The question concerns with all the clinicians out here is when should I ask my individual patient to undergo or screen for a secondary hypertension? All the answer is no. Any patient less than 20 years of age or any patient over and above 60 years of age comes to your clinic for the first time with either a hypertensive urgency, emergency, in these conditions, or if not, the patient is taking adequately more than three antihypertensive drugs, despite which the blood pressure is often uh, difficult to control in these conditions, only you should screen these individuals for the secondary hypertension. Understand this fact very clearly. There should be certain amount of compelling indications. For example, a bilateral small kidneys on renal ultrasound should suspect there could be renal artery stenosis, any adrenal tumor which is seen on this scan along with the hypertension so that you should not um, come to a conclusion depending upon the insulin toma and so on and so forth. So always there should be certain clinical clues and the indications when you're going to ask your patient to screen for the secondary hypertension. Next slide. So what are the general target of the blood pressure uh, as per the British Hypertension Society? Yes, please go ahead with the slide. Next, yeah, next, next. 
and the next now friend let me come to a very interesting point which i have raised in the jnc classification we have come up the dichotomy between the normal tension and the hypertension is it going to end or the time will come when when we are born with we fulfill certain criteria eligible for one particular drug regimen i mean to say that if you talk from the epidemiological perspective and the point of view the incidences of the new cardiovascular hypertension related events start once your the blood pressure increases over and above systolic 110 debashish ji can you mute the other slide i am getting lot of noise disturbances yeah so yeah thank you so strictly speaking from the epidemiological perspective they have found the direct correlations uh, with the uh, target vascular and organ damage uh, to that of the 110 but it is very far from the practical guidelines for the management of the hypertension the question and the debate continues from the various society european society ada american college of physician american college of cardiology kdgo trial and so on and so forth how much and how far to reduce the pressure and in my talk i would like to make it a more practicable and pragmatic approach now what the british hypertension society wants to tell you the home or abpm less than 135 by 85 in less than 80 years of the patient this is very true the office automated blood pressure recording is no longer considered as a diagnostic the patient should be encouraged to have a home blood pressure monitoring and if possible the ambulatory blood pressure recording now has become the gold standard as it can even record your blood pressure when you are sleeping it can even diagnose your blood pressure was so called the resistant hypertension the mast hypertension the white coat hypertension so the daytime usually the daytime as, well as per the british hypertension society the abpm or the home blood pressure target should be less than 130 by 18 less than 80 years wherein those individuals who are about the previous slide please those above the 80 years of age try keeping the blood pressure less than 140 by 85 the persons with a diabetes or an established cvd now it is very clear friends that for all the consensus guideline across the globe that those patients who have a diabetes and established cardiovascular diseases the target goal should be less than 130 by 80 mm of mercury the choice of the drug depends upon the age race and the presence of the comorbid risk condition the degree of blood pressure reduction is very important rather than the choice of the particular drug hence the combination of the drug is preferred and moderate to high intensity statin should be incorporated so what i want to carry forward the message is i remember i think we all remember the good olden days the black patient should receive the calcium channel blockers the white young hypertensive high renin low renin hypertension should receive Uh, ARBs is an abitus friend as per the latest guideline based upon the atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk target organ damage the and the comorbid risk condition we are supposed to select the drug in general if you speak to me it is very clear as per the guideline that the combination of the ACE inhibitors or the ARBs with the calcium channel blockers plus a thiazide type of diuretic is often preferred drug in the management of the hypertension so it is the combination of the drug which works synergistically in reducing the blood pressure is what is more important than rather selection of one particular drug until and unless it is compelled by the underlying comorbid risk condition nevertheless you must always incorporate the use of statins either it is a moderate or high intensity statins based upon the asfd risk factor next slide now before we go for in all my talks i often tell my students that when you contemplate and embark upon a treatment regimen to your patients first thing a physician should know when what not to give so that is what means i want to emphasize here when you are prescribing a thiazide type of diuretic as recommended in the various uh, guidelines if the patient has a gout try prefer not adding the thiazide diuretic if the patient is in the hepatic coma avoid giving a loop diuretic if the patient is already in ckd or that the potassium levels are over and above 5.5 mL equivalent per liter see to it the potassium sparing diuretic should not be used where in the patients like a bilateral renal artery stenosis severe hyperkalemia and pregnancy see to it that you are not going to use ACE inhibitors or ARB in the first place and very important definitely ACE inhibitors and ARBs we do not use in pregnancy as well whereas in the patients like dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker what we know as an amlodipine selenodipine 
in chronic kidney disease with proteinuria why it is very important friend please understand this mark this word which i am trying to tell you dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers and ckd with proteinuria it is very clearly should there be a need to use a calcium channel blockers over and about to control the blood pressure you are going to select a non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like diltiazem verapamil yes in those patients with diabetes or ckd with proteinuria because they do not tend to reduce the interglomerular pressures so this is one of the very important place in these cases with ckd with proteinuria or ckd uh, with diabetes and proteinuria try selecting ace inhibitors first or the arbs and suppose you want to add another molecule in these conditions uh, to control the target blood pressure to less than 130 80 try selecting a non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers next slide so the same contraindications have been continued the ccb the non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers in systolic heart failure and heart block friends i just want to tell you do not try to combine a cardio selective beta beta blockers along with a non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers the higher incidences of the heart failure and chronotropic incompetence has been noted so this is one of the contraindications the beta blockers is preferably why you may tell you i'll tell you the lot many dropouts are there when you try to uh, you know institute a new drug consisting of the beta blocker the most frequent reasons why Why we are uh, not using beta blockers that has been proven in the various trial that it failed to reduce the central aortic blood pressure. Hence, the beta blockers are neither the first line, neither the second line. Probably the third line agent in the management of hypertension. And should there be a necessity if you want to use a beta blocker, try selecting a uh, the vasodilating beta blocker. I am using the word vasodilating beta blockers. Carbidolol, nabilolol, labetalol. These are the drug of choice when you are trying to select it. contrary to the popular belief the beta blockers causes impotency friends it is not so it is the thiazide type of diuretic on the top list which causes the erectile dysfunction and the deadly duo combination when you try to combine a beta blocker with a thiazide type of diuretic that may lead to the sexual dysfunction and especially the erectile dysfunction and the most common reason for the dropout due to the beta blocker is the fatigue and the depression this is one of the most important reason as we are talking about the contraindications the patients who are beta blocker sensitive bronchial asthma not all bronchial asthma depression cocaine and methamphetamine abuse why cocaine the beta blocker should not be used because of the unopposed action of the alpha receptor so when you try to give a beta blocker in these group of patient the unopposed alpha 1 will lead to severe vasoconstriction hence if you want to give a beta blocker ensure in these circumstances on cocaine what we see in the patients with the western population you try to combine with an alpha blocker or try to select a drug which can combine both alpha as well as beta 1 if not alpha blockers systolic hypertension uh, systolic ha heart failure and orthostatic hypertension these are the contraindications where you are not going to use or be cautious while giving an alpha blocker central sympathetic agent all the patients with the orthostatic hypotension and direct vasodilating agent hydralazine and so on and so forth minoxidil in the case of orthostatic hypotension friend i want to add a very important practical tip here to all the clinicians who are practicing here especially the endocrinologist and the diabetologist and the people uh, from the cardiovascular uh, group if you come across a patient who had a diabetes over and above 10 years please do not forget to have a bedside testing for the autonomic instability many of the patient have a resting tachycardia there could be an evidence of the postural hypotension even even at the time when the patient will have a postural hypotension they may not have a reflex tachycardia ideally when there is a systolic drop in the blood pressure due to the autonomic dysfunction there should be a reflex tachycardia the failure of reflex tachycardia i think you should always be seeing these type of thing it is a untouched area why because if you have a clinical evidence of the autonomic insufficiency or the cardiac dysautonomia or a long standing diabetes these patients are at a very high risk of sudden cardiac death so a bedside autonomic function test should be always done when your patient comes to you in a clinic with a history of diabetes or other disease where you think or contemplate there could be an autonomic insufficiency next slide so the comorbidities and the specific condition hypertensive heart disease and all now this is what i am trying to tell you that in which underlying comorbid risk condition which drug should be used now very important thing i want to share all of you hypertensive heart disease when the patient comes with your left ventricular hypertrophy either proven by an ecg 
by voltage criteria or by the 2D eco. So in these group of patients, suppose when you come across, the first line should be the ARBs over and above the beta blockers. When you talk about the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where there is subtle, uh, uh, you know, asymmetric hypertrophy, in order to have a symptomatic relief and the systolic anti-remotion of the mitral leaflet, in those circumstances, we try to give the beta blockers as a first line. But in general, because of the hypertensive heart disease and LVH, in this group of patients, when you're trying to uh, select a drug, try go for the ARBs, which has found to regress the hypertrophy over and above the beta blockers. Next is a stable ischemic heart disease. The patient with a stable ischemic heart disease, the beta blockers are the first line. The dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers is the preferred drug of choice. Friends, as per the latest guidelines I came to know, the combinations of the cardioselective beta blockers with the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like amlodipin should be the first line in relieving the angina. But if you talk from the very important natural history perspective, it is the ACE inhibitors which alters the natural history of the ischemic heart disease right from the stable ischemic heart disease to the established um, uh, postmyocardial infarct syndrome. Like what we have seen, the post MI, the beta blocker should be the first line, the ACE inhibitors and dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Often they are combined together, but the first line should be the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors. As we all know, the post-myocardial infarct heart failure, uh, we have found that the ACE inhibitors in combination with the beta blockers alters the all cause of mortality on which the beta blockers have scored uh, more important points. Uh, the next slide. Peripheral vascular disease. Calcium channel blockers has been used, friends, but the guidelines are not very clear that whether we can go for the calcium channel blockers or the other drug, but the most preferred as per the consensus is the calcium channel blockers. And nevertheless, when you look, come across the peripheral vascular disease, do not forget to have an ankle brachial blood pressure index done. Look for the retinoscopy and uh, try addressing the smoking history, which is very important part in the management. The lifestyle is very, very, very important. CKD, ACE inhibitors or the ARB, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, SGLD2 inhibitors, direct acting vasodilators, and the loop diuretic. Now, uh, my friends, clinicians, I want, to, uh, I want you all to emphasize on this point chronic kidney disease. Uh, as we all know, the moment the patient comes in the stage three, majority of the physicians, even the doctors, we have seen that they drop out and stop the ACE inhibitors from the treatment regimen for the fear that it may increase the creatinine. I want to make the point very clear that the ACE inhibitors or the ARBs, never to be combined together, have found to be the one of the preferred drug in the management of the hypertension in a patient with uh, the chronic kidney disease. They reduces the intragranular pressure. They reduces the further progression towards the end stage renal failure. As a clinician, as a physician, I want that if my patient is already having stage three CKD or above, what more or what else can I add to my patient so I can retard him from going into the end stage kidney failure, necessitating him for the renal replacement therapy? Remember, once when you start an ACE inhibitors and ARBs, it is uh, know that the baseline serum creatinine will increase to more than 30%. If it is within 30%, it is a salutary effect of the molecule. You do not have to change it. Just keep on observing it. After 15 to 20 days, the patient comes to you. If your target blood pressure is still not achieved, escalate the dose to the maximum tolerated. And should there be a rise in the creatinine, then you have to reduce the dose to the 50%. You're not going to stop these inhibitors or ARBs. The only contraindications is severe hyperkalemia, potassium over and above 5.5 milliequivalent per liter, or if there is a bilateral renal artery stenosis or the flashes of the pulmonary edema the patient is experiencing after you start ACE inhibitors or ARB, then only you're going to stop it. Otherwise, you should continue ACE inhibitors or the ARBs. And suppose if you want to add another molecule in order to control the blood pressure, because the patients with the CKD, please understand two important things. The two basic pathophysiological reasons behind the hypertension and chronic kidney disease is enhanced or expanded plasma volume and increased peripheral vascular resistance. These are the two important reasons. And it is very true to say that these patients often requires multiple drugs to control the blood pressure. And it is very challenging for a physician to manage a hypertension in a patient with an established CKD. So there we add a dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. 
As per the latest guidelines in November 2022, we have an SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, which has been especially the dafagliflozinus has got a very good uh, results in the trial, which I've already spoken in my previous talk, that you can incorporate this molecule in the management as a second line agent or third line agent next to the ACE inhibitors. And why? Because they have found when the EGFR is over and above 30 ml per minute, you can start the SGLD2 inhibitors. It reduces the further decline in the EGFR and thereby preventing your patient from going into the end stage renal failure. Direct acting vasodilators are often added. Now, I want to make a very important point. When you're trying to add a direct acting vasodilator agents to these group of patients, even vasodilating beta blockers to the patient with CKD, Understand that at times they may have a fluid retention. So these group of patients often require a loop diuretic. The Thysa diuretic do not work very well as your GFR falls below. Hence, you need to add a loop diuretic. And to which I want to add a point, when you're trying to select a loop diuretic, please see to it that the plasma T half half life of the drug which you're selecting. We have often seen the, uh, the doctors prescribing a frusamide 40 milligram once daily, which is very insufficient. The tosamide is required, which works for 24 hours. And these patients requires a very high dose of the loop diuretic in order to have the volume management. Management. So this is a very important point which I want to share with all of you. The next slide. The CKD with proteinuria. When the patient has a proteinuria, ACE inhibitors or the ARB should be the first line. Again, now I'm trying to emphasize non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. That is not the amlodipin. It is diltiazem or the verapamil in a high dose. SGLD2 inhibitors, and there is one new molecule, fendronone, that is a non-steroidal mineralocortical receptors antagonist, which has got an approval in the management of these patients. They have found to retard the further decline in the EGFR and prevent the patient from going into the end-stage renal failure. The caveat for this is, please check the serum potassium level. It should not be over and above 5.5. So try to keep your potassium level between 4.8 or less when you're adding these drugs. Next slide. Non-diabetic chronic kidney disease with proteinuria, again, the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, non-dihydropyridine uh, calcium channel blocker should be, and vasodilating beta blocker should be added as the uh, fourth line and the loop diuretic. Please understand vasodilating beta blockers are those beta blockers which has been found to have a very good impact on the blood pressure. Metoprolol and uh, other drug like bisoprolol, these are the cardioselective beta blocker. They are more of an anti-anginal drug rather than an anti-hypertensive drug. So what are the vasodilating beta blockers? Carvedilol, labetalol, nebivolol. The uniqueness of the nebivolol is that it releases a nitric oxide, which is a potent vasodilator. So you can have, secondly, you can prescribe the vasodilating beta blockers to the patients who are diabetes as well. As we all know, the beta blockers often predisposes to the diabetes as well as they can cause hypoglycemia and awareness. But supposing while managing the hypertension in these group of patients, when you find that after institution of the ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blocker, your blood pressure is not well controlled after adding SGL2 inhibitor. And those cases, when you want to add a beta blocker, that should be the vasodilating beta blocker. And when you want to add a loop diuretic print, please see to it that the high dose of the loop diuretic has to be used in the initial stages. For all patients with diabetes, the preferred antihypertensive drug is either ACE inhibitors or the ARBs, SGL2 inhibitors. Secondary prevention of the stroke. ACE inhibitors, thiazide diuretic is often the preferred combination, especially the indepamide with the perindropyl combination has been used in the vast majority of trial in secondary prevention of the stroke. This is the drug of choice. Secondary prevention of the coronary event. Now, please understand, this is where we have taken a back seat. You can see the ACE inhibitors and the ARB, the first preferred drug and not the beta blockers. In my previous slide, when we are talking about the stable ISD, we have spoken about the beta blockers. The beta blockers are predominantly anti anginal drug. But when we try to talk about the natural history of the ischemic heart disease, it is the ACE inhibitors or the ARBs, which is a really major uh, drug of choice in our selection, especially those individuals after the myocardial infarction whose ejection fraction is less than 30%. So the combination of the ACE inhibitors and the cardioselective beta blockers should be used in a dose-wise escalation. Gradually increase the dose, wait and watch for 15 days, look at whether target blood pressure is achieved or not, escalate the dose to maximum. In this caveat, I want to add one more point. When you try to escalate the dose, do monitor the creatinine level and see for the evidence of clinical edema. When you try to increase the beta blockers, there are some subsets of the patient develop the edema. In those cases, you require 
to give a few doses of the loop diuretic. Next slide. Next slide. Systolic hypertension of the elderly, CCBs, are the first line preferred molecule. ACE inhibitors are second. The thiazide type of diuretic is the third line agent. I want to add some more point to the management of the hypertension in the systolic hypertension. Next slide. Gestational and yeah. The systolic hypertension of the elderly, when the blood pressure is over and about 50 by 90, now it is a very important debate among the physicians, the cardiologists, and other people you know, who are involved in the management of the hypertension. I want to tell about the CCB, the molecule which has been found as per the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, the pulse variability, the beat to beat variability of the blood pressure is found to be minimal when you institute the CCB in the elderly patients with the systolic hypertension. The next molecule can be ACE inhibitors. The thiazide has been kept on the third line for the reason it has been found. The elderly people are highly susceptible for the symptomatic hyponatremia, which is often seen in the case of the thiazide diuretic. So one should be very careful while adding a thiazide type of diuretic in the elderly people with systolic hypertension. Gestational hypertension, the beta blockers like labetalol is now the first line. The calcium channel blocker nifedipine has often been used in the management of the patients uh, with uh, the gestational hypertension. Atrial fibrillations, in order to control the ventricular rate, uh, we need to give a beta blockers. We'll be discussing about this more in our next slide. So hypertension in the special circumstances hypertension associated with the oral contraceptive pill. Friends, I think everyone here are the teachers. I think, and you might be delivering talks for the MRCP Ireland, as well as UK and, and all the population. In UK and MRCP questions, very commonly, the patient comes to your clinic with uh, OCP, and then she complaining of this, looking for the drug-to-drug -drug interactions, the drug clearance, the inducers, and the inhibitors of cytochrome P450, and so forth. The questions are very common. It has been found that once when you institute an OCP and the patient comes to you for the first time with the raised blood pressure on oral contraceptive pill, the first important thing, you should stop the estrogen containing uh, oral contraceptive pill. It has been found that estrogen is found to raise the systolic blood pressure. On contrary, you'll be surprised to find the estrogen uh, transdermal patches leads to the drop in the blood pressure. So if there be a rise in a blood pressure, once the patient is on oral contraceptive pill, especially the estrogen containing, as a physician, you should try discouraging, asking the patient to stop the OCP, uh, which contains the estrogen. Acute ischemic stroke, if the blood pressure is more than 220 by 120, thrombolytic therapy, mean arterial pressure less than 15 hours in an hour, and labetalol, nicardipine, and nitroprusal. I, I, let me explain you very important friends. A patient comes to you, in a stroke unit, you find the blood pressures are very high. As you all know, within the 4.5 hours of the golden hour, if the patient fulfills the criteria for our, our intravenous alteplase or tenacteplase, the blood pressure should be lowered. How much it should be lowered? It should be lowered to less than 180 by 105 mm of diastolic. And, and in only this is the circumstance where you have to judiciously bring the blood pressure down because you're going to use our IV Alteplase. Unfortunately, here in the India or in many parts of the country, the patient come much later and the blood pressure is very high. The current guidelines in relation to the management of the ischemic stroke with the hypertension clearly states that no antihypertensive molecule should be added. Why? Because the cerebral autoregulation is much different. Only when the blood pressure is more than 220 by 120, or when you find there is an evidence of other target and organ damage, like patient is in frank left heart failure, or the patient is in the aortic dissection or so forth. The mean arterial pressure should be reduced to 15% in the first hour. Please take home this message. 15% in less than the Nwara. The rule of thumb you should remember, friends, all of you, when there is a hypertensive emergency, the 10% of the blood pressure, initial blood pressure should be lowered in first one hour. The remaining three hours to 12 hours, around 10 to 15%, the blood pressure should be reduced. And thereafter, try keep maintaining the blood pressure between 160 and 100 mm of mercury. What are the drug of choice? The first line of treatment is libitolol, nicardipine, and third, I have put as a nitroprusite. Friends, I've done a lot of trial where we have not been using uh, intravenous nitroglycerin for the management of uh, the stroke with hypertension. It is a predominantly venodilator. The nitroprusite has been put in the third line agent. The reason is what they have found that it 
raises the intracranial pressure. And this is true, especially in management of the IC bleed, intracranial hemorrhage due to the hypertension. The libitalol has a proven track record. And the most important drug here with the physicians are less aware is a nicardipin. It is a calcium channel blocker and consistent drop in the blood pressure is what we noticed in the patients with these group of uh, uh, disorders like a stroke or the hemorrhage. One very important point I would like to tell you, there was a trial which was conducted in the IC bleed and the hypertension where the blood pressure was kept around 180 in one group and in other patient, it was kept around 140 in one group, the systolic hypertension. It was found that the overall mortality in these two groups were not much different. So there was a very marginal, yes, but those patients whose blood pressure was kept 140 in the case of intracranial hemorrhage, the size of the hematoma did not increase that much. There was less disability, but overall mortality was not that significant. So within the first hour, friends, please understand the 10 to 15% of the mean arterial blood pressure has to be reduced and try keeping the mean arterial pressure less than 130. And only intervention is required when the BP is more than 220 by 120 with the evidence of other target vascular and organ damage. If not, please do not try to treat that hypertension in the initial days of the stroke, especially the ischemic stroke. The next slide. So the role of parenteral, the role of parenteral antihypertensive drug like labetalol, sodium nitroprusside, and nicardipin. Next slide. As far as the stroke has been con uh, concerned, friends, it has been found in the large randomized trial it is the dedicated stroke unit consisting of a team of a physician, neurologist, neurosurgeon, uh, the specialized nurse, the physician, uh, the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist that makes a definitive uh, positive outcome in overall improvement of the patient. There's one more clinical condition where the patient comes to you with a high blood pressure and with acute pulmonary edema. Please understand this is very good uh, drug of choice which we have selected here. The combination of sodium nitroprusside with the loop diuretic should be combined. Please understand, not the sodium nitroprusside alone. It should be combined with the loop diuretic. If it is not available, you can combine with the nitroglycerin with the loop diuretic. You can combine urapidil with the loop diuretic. Urapidil is a central sympathetic agent. So in the management of acute pulmonary edema attributed to the raised blood pressure, these are the drug of choice which you're going to use it. When you try to step down the therapy from your acute hypertensive urgencies or the emergencies, that is very important. Weaning the patient from the parental antihypertensive, then you try to select the drug based upon the underlying comorbid condition. Try selecting the drug which should have a shorter half-life. For example, captopril. In a short dose, you can give it to your patients. You can start oral labetalol. They are also short-acting agent. And then you can sh shift your patient to the longer acting antihypertensive agents. That is the fashion, that is the way one, sh one should go with. In the patient with an acute coronary syndrome, intravenous nitroglycerin and the parenteral beta blockers, metoprolol is often used in the management of the acute coronary syndrome with the hypertension. Pheochromocytoma, it is the surgeon's uh, nightmare, I can tell you. Uh, as I remember, I, I was been called as a physician expert to manage the two patients whom we have diagnosed pheochromocytoma and we were about to operate and what would happen the moment you try to touch the glands during the surgery. So the fentolamine should be kept ready and the sodium nitroprusside and urapidil should be the drug which should be always ready with you when you're trying to manage a pheochromocytoma and the patient is proven. Very important thing I want to tell you, friends, a lot many physicians, the cardiologists practicing here, they might be encountering the patient says that they are compliant with their drug regimen. They land up in the casualty with a very high blood pressure, tachycardia, perspirations, and even the varying degrees of ventricular arrhythmias. Many a times we think that the patient is already on three or four antihypertensive drug, and you suspect this patient has got a pheochromocytoma. Even in these patients, even on they are on drugs, friends, it has been found that in first 24 to 48 hours, if you collect the 24 hours urinary free metanephrine or fractionated metanephrines, they are equally highly reliable investigation of choice, especially in the case of the pheochromocytoma. While managing these pheochromocytoma, the fentolamine is the molecule of choice and phenoxybenzamine we use as an oral agent later on. But for the parenteral cases, it's a fentolamine, sodium nitroprusside, which is a potent arterial, arterial vasodilator and the central sympathetic agent, urapidil, is a molecule of choice. Perioperative, especially during and after CABG. It's again after the post-operative, then the patient glands up in a very severe hypertension. It is the nicardipin. Why nicardipin? For the consistency and stable blood pressure reduction what has been found with the nicardipin, no B2B variability is noted. 
urapetil and the nitroglycerin is the next molecule. Please understand, in management of the hypertensive urgency or the emergency, as I said you, I'm re-emphasizing, never attempt to bring the blood pressure back to normal because of the altered cerebral autoregulation and it may precipitate acute kidney injury. But there are always an exception. What are these exceptions? Number one, if you want to give an IV alter place for the stroke, you need to bring down the blood pressure immediately. Should there be an aortic dissection, you have to bring the blood pressure immediately down. And if there are the bleeding from the suture site, the vascular site, post-operative with hypertension, these are the three only conditions where you have to emergently bring down the blood pressure to the normal limit. Next slide. During craniotomy, yes, the nicardipin is the molecule, the first drug of choice, and next is the labetalol molecule. You can use it as a parenteral drug. Aortic dissection immediately bring the systolic BP to less than 110, and nitroprusside should be combined with the metroprolol or the labetalol. The combination of sodium nitroprusside with this molecule has to be combined in the management because it prevents the further shear forces and the further worsening of the dissection. Next slide. Preeclampsia, eclampsia. This is again the physician, the practicing the uh, especially the obstetric medicine. A patient with more than 160, 110 is in pregnancy, is in hypertensive emergency with or without uh, the evidence of uh, the target organ damage. Now, these pregnant patients will often keep it as a separate uh, clinical criteria. As we know, the proteinuria, there will be headache, visual obscurations, but there are different criteria which have been used. When managing these patients, pregnant patients with a very high blood pressure, I repeat, 160 by 110, it is not just the blood pressure, friends. You have to see for the coagulopathy. You have to see the liver dysfunction. You have to look in for the renal failure as well. And the most important, the delivery of the product of gestation, you have to immediately talk to the obstetrician and you have to plan for the delivery of the fetus, if uh, it is viable obstetrically, usually as per the guideline, over and above 36 weeks of gestation. And you have to start giving the drug, especially immediately in the parenteral libitolol, along with the magnesium sulfate, as a prophylactic to prevent the patient landing up in eclampsia because they carry a very high mortality rate. Let me take you take a very simple point very clearly here that even after the delivery, up till next 28 days, the patient can have eclampsia. So that is the criteria. It's not just the blood pressure. It is the multiple organ manifestation, which has to be seen like coagulopathy, kidney failure, hepatic dysfunction, thrombocytopenia, all these things the physician should address apart from it. But in acute emergency, start with intravenous labetalol and give intravenous magnesium sulfate immediately. Next slide. Hypertension in special circumstances. Resistance hypertension. This is a good talk, which I, I, I really want to share. A very important, this is a lengthy one. So I'll just take a small, just when we label a patient to be resistant, when the blood pressure is over and above the target goal, more than 140, 90, the patient is already taking three drugs, out of which one should be a diuretic. And despite which the blood pressure is very high, you should think labeling the patient as a resistant hypertension. But wait, wait, wait. Always when the patient, when you label the patient as a resistant hypertension, the first and the very important thing you should ask the compliance, whether the patient is taking the drugs properly as prescribed by the physician. If yes, try look for the drugs which the patient is taking other than your treatment. In an India and other parts of the world, the patient frequently visits the other specialists and the doctors often prescribe a good amount of drug, especially the orthopedician. They use a high dose of NSAIDs. The NSAID antagonize the effect of the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and the patient may land up in these. Certain chemotherapeutic agents, they can also lead to the um, blunting of the effect of the antihypertensive drug, especially the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. And very important point, friends, I want to tell you that if you don't ensure that your patient is on the low sodium diet, irrespective where you're giving ACE inhibitors or thiazide diuretic, the antihypertensive effect will not be achieved. Again, I repeat, if the sodium intake is not reduced, the ideal antihypertensive effect of the ACE inhibitors and ARB cannot be achieved. So these are the pseudo resistance. Even while measuring the blood pressure, if you're not using the appropriate cuff size, if you don't see, even you have to look for the Osler's sign, that means your BP is uh, your recording and still you can palpate the radial artery pulse. So all these things, the caveat and small things you have to see before labeling the patient as a pseudo, uh, as a resistant, a resistant hypertension. So these fall in the case of a pseudo resistance. Now let us take a 
example, you have diagnosed and you have confirmed this patient is, has really got a resistant hypertension. Now in this thing, you have to see your drug, whether you're giving a drug which is appropriate. For example, you're prescribing a low dose lasixfrosamide for a patient with CKD. That is not the appropriate drug of choice. You should shift on the high dose torsamide. You're giving a thyroid type of diuretic to the patient with CKD. As you all know, the thyroid type of diuretic that works not that very well in the patient with an impaired GFR, except for the metalazone I'm talking about. So try selecting the drugs. You're giving Lozartan 25 milligram once daily. That is also the inadequate drug which you're giving. You should shift to the drug which will work on 24 hours parameters. So just see at your drug. And if it is a really a resistance, then you're going to add a drug which is called as a mineralocorticoid receptors antagonist, aplerinone, fenrenone, spinolactone. Again, the caveat for this is, C, the patient should not be in a renal failure and the potassium should not be over and above 5.5 milli equivalent per liter. And even after adding this four drug, the other things have been ruled out and the BP is difficult to manage. There, friends, you're going to use the drug called as a beta blocker, especially the vasodilating beta blocker. I repeat again, uh, labetalol, carbidolol, and nebivalol. These are the vasodilating beta blockers you're going to, and if still it is not controlled, then central sympathetic agents and so on, so on, you can use in the management of the resistant hypertension. See to it that on one hand, when you're trying to manage the resistant hypertension, kindly look that the patient should not have an orthostatic hypertension, or if not, aggressive management may lead to acute kidney injury. So you have to see both these things while managing the resistant hypertension. As far as the device therapy, the denervations of the renal and the carotid stenting, these are investigational and are subject for the further research. Uh, the initial data, what I have uh, procured, seems to be quite promising, but still they have a way, uh, um, quite a way from, to find their place in the uh, guidelines. Now, Acute severe hypertension, as I said you, or in parental drug, the rule of thumb. The 10%, the first initial 10% of the system of the blood pressure should be reduced in the first one hour. The additional 15% should be reduced over three to 12 hours and no less than 160 by 110, except post-operative bleeding from the vascular suture line and the aortic dissection. Certain race and ethnicity, yes, the African-Americans, certain group of people, they do not respond to the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, even thyroid diuretic. They require a very high dose of the calcium channel blocker. That also plays a very important role in management. And also important, the last one, which I just want to emphasize is hypertension and the old age. The goal, the drugs, the concern, and the orthostatic hypertension. The patient, the goals in the individual with uh, the hypertension who are in above. Now, the question is, uh, what is the definition of an old age? So nobody wants to be called old age. As per the guideline, they clearly say that the patients who are in above 65 years, for them, try keeping the blood pressure, if uh, not contraindicated, to nearly 130, 80. And if the age is more than 80 years of age, try keeping the blood pressure less than 150 by 90. Now, these old people often have a lot of comorbid risk condition, frailties, and these patients are often prone to develop the very immediate manifestation of the side effect of antihypertensive uh, hypertensive molecule, especially the thyroid. Even the patient may develop symptomatic hyponatremia as a confusion, delusion. There could be a partial fall in the blood pressure. Even these patients often have a frail, and as I said, you the fall in the, the these are the major concern for the physicians who are treating the geriatric cases. So try selecting the drug which should uh, uh, cause a least precipitation. And of this, as per the guideline, the most preferred drug is the calcium channel blocker, the CCB, especially the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. And majority of these uh, geriatric populations are, at, if not, at the highest risk of developing the stroke. Why? Because as we all know, the arteriopathy, the end organ, the brain, the vessels starts getting, uh, the vessels uh, find the highline degenerations and they are more prone. So the majority of these group may come to you, the doctor, I'm fine, I'm well, I don't have any symptoms, but I don't want a disabling stroke. There where the interventions may come. Again, to this uh, special chapter of the hypertension in old age, I want all physicians and the cardiologists to apply the guidelines of the precision medicine. The precision medicine states that the guideline should be modified to the individual needs of a patient. So if a patient comes to you with a 70 years, hale and hearty, 
and he doesn't have any more uh, comorbid risk condition and still you can say that the patient may have a good survival. In these group of patients, you can show an aggressive approach, try to bring down the blood pressure near 130, 80. But suppose if you come across a patient who is 75 with diabetes, with ischemic heart disease, with a cardiac autonom dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction with a postural fall, erectile dysfunctions, urinary disturbances, and frequent fall, then in such group of patients, you don't need to show an aggressive approach. In these group of patients, you can keep and maintain the blood pressure over and above 150 or 90 because uh, the concept of the principle of medicine is what Dr. Jenser has rightly said in the introduction, primum non non serif first do no harm. My therapeutic intervention should not create a new problem to the patient. So this is what is the approach is all about. And very important thing uh, in these group of patients, especially the geriatric, two important thing I want to emphasize here. One is the supine hypertension and other is a postprandial hypotension. These geriatric patients, after consuming a meal, often experience severe drop in the blood pressure because of the distribution of the blood. So they experience severe giddiness. And when you document, you see the blood pressure is dropped. This is well documented during the ambulatory blood pressure reading. And the other is the supine. The moment they lie down, you might have noticed this, these group of patients, after lying down 20 to 30 mm of mercury, the blood pressure is on the highest side. So it is a very uh, difficult challenge before a physician to manage a postprandial hypotension and supine hypertension. For the postprandial hypertension, the guideline says that you must tell these patients to have a small meals, try preferring having some caffeine along with it. And if there is a very symptomatic severe hypertension, then you can add uh, certain drugs which can increase the blood pressure, like fluorocortisone. Again, it's a caveat. You have to monitor the electrolytes. It has to be, it is a really challenging for a physician. It's not that simple job. And for the supine hypertension, where the blood pressure rises, uh, it is very funny, but what I have noticed in the guidelines, they say that you should encourage the patient to not lie supine for a prolonged period or try to sleep in a reclining chair. This is what has been recommended in the management of the hypertension, especially the elderly who experiences supine hypertension and postprandial hypertension. Next slide. Uh, it was a good talk and lengthy talk. I tried my uh, level best to make it practicable, comprehensible and pragmatic approach and uh, which drug for which given condition and comorbid risk condition. I thank you, the entire RCPI Indian chapter team, all the doctors here, and special thanks to AstraZeneca Pharmaceutical Company for sponsoring this talk. And thank you, everyone, for your kind listening. Uh, thank you, Avinash, for a wonderful talk. And now we move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Kaushik Ghosh. Yeah. The Associate Professor from the Department of Medicine, Murshidabad Medical College, and he is going to talk to us on management of sepsis. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, please. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Before that, I think uh, although its time has been quite uh, longer than expected, there should be a few minutes of discussion and question time. Although uh, Abhilas's talk was longer than expected, and uh, uh, before he starts, I think I. That's, uh, the chairperson has been there, but uh, can you start, Sumit Acharya, please start the conclusion and a few words before we go to the next talk. Yeah, I'd uh, like to add a few points here. Although the topic is well covered and uh, he has gone into all the aspects of uh, management of hypertension <clears throat> and uh, rightly said that uh, hypertension management should be tailor-made for that patient uh, considering all the comorbidities and his uh, uh, requirements. Now, uh, all the slides are very good, but I would uh, like to comment a little bit on this LVH. There was one slide in which you have shown that LVH, ARB is the drug of choice, and the second one is the beta blocker. I would uh, probably uh, not agree with this because calcium channel blocker should be there because as you said, Beta blocker increases central pressure. You have only said that beta blocker increases central pressure. So with LVH, if you give beta blocker, until and unless he has got a uh, comorbidity of, uh, say, ischemic heart disease, beta blocker is justified. But if there is no ischemic heart disease, I think uh, calcium channel blocker should be uh, the drug of choice next to ARBs. Uh, there is another point I would like to say in CKD, HGLT2. 
in CKD, SGLT2 inhibitor is a very good uh, proposition here. But I would highlight these CKD patients, they are also prone for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So SGLT2 inhibitors are very good in this subset of patients. So it is uh, not only for uh, uh, the blood pressure control, but I would uh, suggest that it is also a drug of choice for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The other point I would like to say in acute pulmonary edema, you have suggested nitroprusside as the first drug with diuretic. But nitroprusside is a very risky drug until and unless you monitor the pressure, blood pressure very intensively. Now, monitoring the blood pressure with a cuff, BP cuff, may not be always accurate. So what we tend to do in our setting, especially in cardiovascular medicine, we put a central line with uh, arterial monitor and we monitor arterial blood pressure. And SNP is also known to cause precipitous fall of blood pressure. So use of SNP should be a bit cautious and uh, should be done with uh, arterial blood pressure monitor. Other points are very good. ACS, GTN uh, and beta blocker, it's a very good combination should be done. Um, now I would, uh, like to add another point here. Now, what I am experiencing in my clinical practice, now a patient, say for example, is on say ACE inhibitor, some diuretic and some calcium channel blocker. So he roams around in the sunlight with so much sweating. And now what he says that his blood pressure used to be very well controlled within range. Now he's coming back with hypotension. So this is a very common complaint with most of the patients I'm seeing now. The usual medication is now causing hypotension. So excessive perspiration, excessive sweating, excessive salt loss is again one of the cause for uh, lowering of the blood pressure, especially in this hot summer months. So this is again another situation where you might need to cut down the dose of, say, the ACE inhibitor or the diuretic because again that adds to the uh, uh, the uh, amount of uh, water loss or the salt loss so these are the few points i would uh, like to add and uh, otherwise the talk was very good and it was enlightening and it has covered most of the uh, topics uh, thank you dr acharya for your wonderful inputs and comments now we move on to the next speaker dr koshin kosh Hello. Good afternoon, sir. <clears throat> the respected teacher and my colleague and my juniors. Today, we are here to discuss the approach to the sepsis and the survival sepsis campaign. Particularly after the post-COVID era, the importance of the sepsis and particularly the immunoregulation and the host immune response is coming to the focus in the management system. And in 2021, the consensus guidelines of survival sepsis campaign has rightly addressed all these issues. For the next few slides, I will try to approach to the sepsis and will highlight a few important points of the survival sepsis campaign. Next, please. Uh, next, please. So more than 100 years ago, William Mosler, with no need to introduction, had mentioned the patient appears to die from the patient's body's response to an infection rather than from the infection itself. And here lies the definition and the difference between sepsis and the infection. Though we frequently term this both as interchangeable, but in fact, the sepsis and the infection are quite different in their own right. I will highlight it in the next slide, please. 
So sepsis as a global burden, it was already there. And after with the complicated lifestyle, with lengthy lifestyle and the prolonged ICU stay, the burden of the sepsis and the superbug is increasing day by day. As a Lancet study estimate, 48.9 million cases of sepsis and 11 million sepsis are dead worldwide in 2017. And in India, the ratio will be highlighted as approaching nearly 50 per thousand of cases, which is quite high. Next slide, please. And the India, the alarming statistics of 1 lakh people, a uh, date of 213 per 1 lakh people in India. It is a Telegraph Online report, and that is quite alarming sepsis. And you have already known that Delhi bug has a infamous bug, which causes a maximum death in some certain areas of the ICU category. Next slide, please. Next. So the definitions and the difference, this is the most important thing, though we are interchangeably use the various terms, but the sepsis terms as a systemic inflammatory response syndrome with the infectious or non-infectious etiologies, not necessarily to be it to be, always the infectious one. And severe sepsis indicates with the sepsis with one or two organ failure or dysfunction along with the sepsis criteria. And septic shock is characterized by the persistent hypertension of the MAP is less than 65 mm of Hg, and there is resultant organ dysfunction, and that is characterized by septic shock. Next, please. So the bacterial sepsis, viral sepsis, and the fungal sepsis, or sometimes the non-bacteriological sepsis or non-infectious sepsis, they have what common? That is the host response. And when this host response is becoming disproportionate, it is the immune-mediated damage that caused the cost to the patient more than the infectious agent itself. Next, please. So the definition, how it's come to here, in our teaching, we were frequently termed the SIRS. It was a 1991 consensus conference guidelines that the SIRS is characterized by the inflammation with the hypertension or the uh, with uh, temperature of more than 36 degrees to 38 degrees Celsius or the less than 36 degrees Celsius, along with the hypertension and tissue perfusion dysfunction. And there is also the tachypnea characterized by more than 20 bits per minute. And the sepsis is along with eliminations of the suspicious infection along with it. And the septic shock, which is characterized by the shock and organ dysfunction. And in 2001, international sepsis guidelines, they have it noticed that there are a few other conditions or the other terminology that is much more important than to addressing this simple SIRS or sepsis criteria. And 2016 third international consensus or the definitions of the sepsis, they have mentioned the sepsis as a life-threatening condition with a SOFA S4 is more or less more than two points and the organ dysfunction should be uh, identified as an acute onset and whether the septic shock is a mean arterial pressure of less than 65 mmHg along with a serum lactate concentration, which is a marker of the tissue hypoxia should be more than seven millimole per liter. Next, please. So how this concept of the sepsis evolved? It evolved through the years. From 1996, the development of the sepsis could be classified as an early systemic inflammatory response or the SIRS stage, which subsequently followed by a later compensatory anti-inflammatory response stage. So it was a quite simple. One infection or inflammatory starts and it is counteracted by a inflammatory uh, compensation. And in 2000, this hypothesis, hypothesis regarding the SIRS that is gone through the compensatory inflammatory response syndrome or the CARS. And this concept of the CARS or the compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome gone over the year and it's paved away in 2018. That says that the sepsis or the septic shock or septicemia are all is a continuum of a diminished dysfunction of the immune system or the hyper-regulated immune system. And the term cytokine, cytokine storm was addressed at the stage. Next, please. Next, please. 
So pathophysiology, I would like to just highlight in that the release of the inflammatory mediators by the innate immune cells upon the pathogen recognition with the anti-inflammatory markers, a damaging of the endothelial lineage, rolling of the extravasation of the neutrophils, and along with the underscore the pathophysiology of organ dysfunction, and also the leakage of the tissue fluids and subsequently hypertension during the sepsis. And what is the most important thing? There is a neutral anticoagulant factor such as activated protein C or the antithrombin and tissue plasminogen activator that are all released into the septic patient and that results into a procoagulant state. And this procoagulant state can cause the end organ damage, particularly of mention of the renal failure. So a patient of the acute renal failure or the acute kidney injury in the severe sepsis settings should not be treated by the dialysis unless there are other compounding factors. It is the sepsis-mediated immune regulation that is causing the procoagulant state and also the procoagulated blockage of the renal arterial. Next, please. And immunopathology of sepsis, again, the same one, the release of the inflammatory markers, systemic inflammation of the innate immune system, that may result into a cytokine storm. If it is settled down, then okay. Otherwise, it is a severe and persistent inflammatory response from the human body, and that results in the tissue damage, cellular compromise, and ultimately all leads to the multi-organ dysfunction symptom, lead by death. Next, please. So this illustration of the sequential step of the infection, that is, I have already mentioned, that is, next please. Next please. So, that this is the important line that a compensatory inflammatory response syndrome or in short, a balanced response. So whenever there is an infection or an assault in the human body or human innate immunity, there is a response that is called the anti-inflammatory response. When this balance is disturbed and when this balance is dysregulated by any means, being it is an immunosuppression or it may be a hyperimmunary state, that leads to the damage or that leads to the multi-organ dysfunction. Next, please. Next, so what differentiates sepsis from infection is an aberrant and dysregulated host response and the presence of the organ dysfunction, not the virus or the bacteria or the fungus itself. So the slides that is showing, there are the waves, that is the inflammation and there is immunosuppression and it's followed by the regulation. So next please, in the next slide, what is the dysregulation and what is adaptation? So in the previous slide, the initial model was believed to be the biphasic. That means the inflammatory response would be followed by the immunosuppressive response. But it was later recognized that it is not the biphasic one or it is not following the previous one, but these are concomitant. That one response prevailing over the other and which is the clinical manifestation depends on which one is prevailing over the other. And the persistent inflammation, immunosuppression, and the catabolism syndrome in the survived initial sepsis or the trauma event that leads to the death, in particularly prolonged stay in the ICO. And the above concept converts to conclude that the cells from the innate and the adaptive immune systems are the hyporesponsive in the protected septic patient. Next, please. So these are the recognition center diagnosis. I would like you to just inform that the Q SOPA or the, this is a bedside uh, quick SOPA score that just incorporate three parameters, the systolic blood pressure of 100 mm of Hg or less and the respiratory rate of the 22, uh, 22 per minute. That means the tachypnea present or late and also the altered mental status. So these are very simple. And this simplicity leads to the over diagnosis um, sometimes and the consensus guidelines in the survival sepsis in 2021 discouraged to use the QSOPA as a combination of our MUSE or the early national warning syndrome. I will come in later on these slides. Next, please. So the, what is the ideal treatment for sepsis throughout the course? The ideal treatment depends on the stage. If it is the early stage, the first and foremost important thing is to the, remove the source Remove the source of the infection whenever the possible and contain the source of the infection when it is possible. Implement the early antibiotics if the source is supposed to be the infectious one. 
support with the catecholamines and the organ support. And if it is a continuous immunosuppressor is going on, there may be the cytokine storm or there may not be the cytokine storm. If it is cytokine storm, then only the anti-cytokine parameter, anti-cytokine uh, molecules can be utilized. And if there is no cytokine storm, then we have don't need to go for any immunotherapy. Next, please. So the immunomodulation, the choice of drug, its dose, and the time of administration are the critical aspect. Till that we do not agree, we are not a consensus opinion about when to use the immunomodulator therapy. Is it early, is it middle, or is it late? But it is proven that earlier it is better, but with the late, it does not delay, or at least does not reduce the infection rate, uh, sorry, the mortality rate. And the use of the available immunomodulators at the right dose to derive the optimal clinical benefit is of utmost important in our clinical practices. Next, please. So next, so what? Next, please. So what the immunomodulation in the sepsis we have in our hand, example stands with the steroid, inlastatin, etrolizumab, thymosin alpha-1, tocilizumab, or other intravenous immunoglobulins. So all have the dedicated trials in favor, but when the pooled analysis shows, that thing is coming to a point. It is the most important parameter of using etrolizumab or the tocilizumab, in particularly the COVID cytokine storm, does not conclude it and does not it find its place into the any guidelines. Next, please. Next one. So coming to the clinical one, the surviving sepsis campaign, the international guidelines for managing the sepsis and the septic shock. So the practical question is, which agent, when to start, what targeted to set in the blood pressure monitoring, and when to add the second vasopressor. So these three or four questions is the most important in managing the septic or the septicemia in our clinical practices. Next. So norepinephrine is the first line vasopressor agent in adult septic shock. So this have a strong evidence, if not strong, but moderate evidence, and a strong recommendation against the use of the dopamine when it is the source, so it seemed to be a septic one. And the vasopressin have moderately quality evidence, so also epinephrine and uh, uh, angiotensin II, celiptesin, they have very low quality evidence or lack of the clinical data. Next, please. So the target map, there is a compound study, next, please, of high map versus low map, that is, map setting to the 65 or map around 80 to 85. After the pooled analysis, next slide, please. The pooled analysis ultimately shows that there is no difference in mortality when map of 60 to 65 mmHg is compared to the map of 80 to 85 mmHg. So the guideline says the map should be settled within the map lowest uh, possible level of 65 mmHg. Next, please. So timing of the vasopressor initiation and the mortality in septic shock, a cohort study. This study has shown that early initiation of the vasopressor is uh, beneficial, but late initiation of the vasopressor does not reduce the ventilation rate or the slow the recovery rate. But in a dictum, there is a moderate, next slide, please. And the next. So there is delay in initiation of the vasopressor therapy in septic shock moderately associated with the organ failure at the mortality risk, but the vasopressor initiator delay is not directly associated with increased time on the vasopressor or the increased time on the mechanical ventilation. Next, please. So the question, the third question was in our previous slide that when to add the second agent and which agent? It is now evidence that the second agent is the, should be the vasopressin when the norepinephrine dose in the range of the 25 to 0.25 to 0.50 microgram per kg per minute is overcome. So we have to add the vasopressin as a second vasopressor agent in time of the shock management. Next, please. So the strategy they propose to us, the vasopressin in the septic shock is to early initiation when, next slide, the next slide, Sage. When there is a recommended 
highest level of the noradrenaline in his acid. That is means the 0.50 microgram per kg per uh, body weight uh, has been uh, per minute has been achieved, but still the patient does not attain the map of at least 65. Next, please. So the septic shock with cardiac dysfunction with persistent hyperfusion and the dubito dobutamine, norepinephrine, or the epinephrine. Dobutamine can be added if there is cardiac dysfunction along with the septic patient and who have the persistent hypoperfusion. Otherwise, the norepinephrine followed by uh, vasopressin is the drug of choice in the vasopressor whenever there is septic shock. The next, the most important is the antibiotic timing. So the algorithm I would like to suggest if their shock is present or shock is absent. So sepsis is a definite or probable. If there is the tilt or evidence that septic or the septic focus is present, then administer antimicrobials immediately. Ideally, within the one hour of the recognition, it is the survival sepsis bundle of one hour. Before it, we have to collect the blood culture sample and also the lactate level. And we have to administer a broad spectrum of antibiotics immediately upon recognition. At the same time, we also have to contain the source of the infection or to remove the source if it is possible. And if sepsis is possible, but not definite, then again also we have to administer the antimicrobials immediately, ideally within the first bundle of care. That means one hour of recognition. And the rapid assessment of the infectious versus non-infectious causes of the acute illness to be followed upon the administration of the antimicrobials. And the administration of the antimicrobials within three hours, if concerned, it infects infection persists. So the take-home message is to apply the antibiotics as early as possible. And the timing of the vasoactive agents and the corticosteroid initiation in the septic shock, I will again mention in the later slides, please. Next, please. Previous one, please. So this is the important, what vasoactive agent management? So the take home message from here that the vasoactive agent is a norepinephrine is the first line vasopressor. A map should be targeted around 65 mm of Hg and the considered invasive monitoring of the arterial blood pressure. That is most important is the dynamic monitoring rather than the static monitoring. And the consider initiating vasopressor peripherally if the central line is delayed, so it should not be an excuse to start the vasopressor, and we have to be arranged the central line to proper uh, citation of the proper site for the vasopressor. And second agent, like the vasopressin, should be added whenever the map is not achieved after the full dose of the norepinephrine. And if cardiac dysfunction is suspected and persistent hypoperfusion is present, then we can consider the dobutamine or we can switch it to the epinephrine alone. Next, please. So the next four or five slides are basically the current recommendations and changes from the previous 2016 recommendation, which has been incorporated into the 2021 survival sepsis campaigns. Here, there is no strong recommendation or found over there, but what are the changes has been mentioned, I will summarize into the later on slides. Please move to the last slides. So in summary, the what are the recommendation has been mentioned is that the vasopressin should be initiated if the patient with the sepsis remains hypotensive despite initial fluid administration. Regarding the fluid administration, the survival sepsis campaign guidelines directly says the crystalloid is the fluid of the choice. And colloid does not have a corroborative evidence, only exception over there if the amount of the crystalloid is much more. And if it is even after the 50 ml per kg per hour, it is the recommended, highest recommended dose, then we can give the crystal colloid, but starch is not recommended by any means for the uh, early research fluid. And the first line vasopressor for the septic shock is norepinephrine, and it should be initiated if the MAP is less than 65 mm uh, of Hg, and early vasopressin can be considered given that the protocol-based peripheral vasopressor use safe during the initial resuscitation. And the septic acute kidney injury is no longer considered a disease that the microcirculation, but rather disorder of the renal microcirculation. I have mentioned it earlier, so the acute kidney injury or the rising creatinine 
or the rising urea titer is not an indication of dialysis or the rescue dialysis in the clinical care uh, setting unless there are other compelling indications like persistent hyperkalemia or the resultant oliguria or the uremic encephalopathy or the uremic states over there. So in summary or conclusion, next slide, please. I would like to again the emphasis on the add vasopressors second whenever the map is not achieved with adequate free research research station. And the non-epinephrine, norepinephrine is the first line vasopressor in the septic shock. And the target map is still more than 65 mmHg. And do not delay to start the vasopressor when hypotension persists. So in terms of the uh, maintaining the sepsis or the septic shock, the first thing is to initiate fluid resuscitation at the first hour at a rate of 30 ml per kg. And within one hour, if the desired map is not achieved after the dynamic variables are within range, then we have to start the norepinephrine. And if the norepinephrine does not give us the required map, then we will add the vasopressin. And if the patient has a cardiac dysfunction, then we can uh, consider dobutamine in place of the vasopressin or move to the epinephrine uh, altogether. And we have to, at the same time, have to control the source. If there, suppose a patient is a pyronephr uh, pyronephritis is the source, or there is a diabetic food or the compelling, uh, it is not the level of the sugar or the level of the diabetes that is the uh, compelling factor, but we have to remove the source or at least reduce the contain the source. The source reduction is much more important. And we should not delay to start vasopressor whenever vaso hypotension is persist. And vasopressin, as I have already mentioned, when norepinephrine exerts its doses of highest 0 0.50 microgram per minute, we should add as a vasopressin or a second one. So survival sepsis campaign 2021 or the survival uh, the bundle care of the first hour says that we have to collect the blood within the first contact of the patient. We have to send it for the blood culture, have to obtain the lactate level, and we have to start the fluid resuscitation with the crystalloid, and we will add the noradrenaline if the fluid resuscitation failed, and we will add the second vasopressin agent as a terms of the vasopressor in the septic shock, and we have to reduce the lactate from less than four millimol per liter, and we have to make the patient non-oliguric or the renal perfusion should be the parameter of resolving septic shock. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me for this exhaustive data. Thank you. Uh, any comments, uh, Dr. Paul, uh, on this uh, talk on sepsis? Well, of course, sir, uh, despite our best efforts, uh, we have seen that it has been very difficult to salvage precious lives uh, suffering from sepsis. The surviving sepsis guidelines just give an outline as to how we should proceed uh, with uh, resuscitation, give antibiotics. But we all know that this is not the end of the story. And we have to uh, be more, more uh, uh, buoyant about finding the right uh, choice of antibiotics because we have exhausted the antibiotic armamentarium. If you look at the uh, horizon, there are no good antibiotics in the offing, and the antibiotics that we have been using these days are falling into the resistant uh, patterns. The bugs are much skilled, and we know that antibiotics and resuscitation and uh, vasoactive agents altogether, we are still not reaching the goal. So there are other avenues that need to be explored, like uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh has already said about the immunopathology of sepsis. And I think personally that immunomodulation in sepsis or immunomodulatory therapy in sepsis is going to dominate the picture over the next decade when the antibiotics will slowly but certainly fall irrelevant. All other points have been excellently covered by Dr. Ghosh. And I think this will give a very deep insight that will help us manage our septic patients better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And uh, with this, we move on to the uh, the last talk of the session. That is <clears throat> Dr. by Dr. M. K. Mukhopadhyay, who is a consultant endocrinologist. His talk is an upstream approach to address weight of diabetics with oral semiglutide. Dr. Mukhopadhyay, please. 
Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for staying back for so long. Um, um, the only thing which is unifying today is, uh, I'm not sure whether it was done purposely or not, is that we're trying to, uh, um, uh, can you give me the control, please, Devash, if you can, um, is type 2 diabetes. You know, the patients, uh, the Dr. Abhilash Chiwali told us about hypertension, heart failure, and everything. That is very typical of your patient with type 2 diabetes. Um, the second speaker, Dr. Koshu, goes told us about sepsis, which is um, a, a big problem also in our patients with type 2 diabetes. So, uh, no, I can't take control. Anyway, uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? So, we have uh, something called a syndemic. You know, uh, if you uh, thought of the last 10 years, uh, we have, there was a term, a coin uh, term, which was coined, which is called diabetes, diabetes and obesity, and this has driven the epidemic of uh, diabetes, uh, not only in India and Asia, but uh, throughout the world. And so, this term, which you saw on the first screen, it's syndemic. That means two uh, comorbid conditions which are aggravating to each other to cause an but excessive amount audible. of complications. I'm not audible at all. Yeah, now, now you're audible. Okay. Okay, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so today we'll be discussing about these things, which is the burden of weight in diabetes. So basically, I'll try to throw my weight around and see whether it really matters and weight, whether weight matters in a patient with type 2 diabetes. We need to address the sinister, uh, as I discussed, Silagism with this upstream approach. So we'll be introducing some new terms, upstream and downstream. And look at the place of oral semaglutide in managing a patient with diabetes. I'm sure you uh, know that semaglutide in the oral form has been available um, uh, for more than a year now. And it is a path breaking uh, um, measure as far as our treatment in the patient with type 2 diabetes because it is the first time that the injectable uh, protein, which was being uh, injected for the uh, almost a decade now in various forms. We had lirogatide and, and uh, its predecessors. But it's the first time that a protein was administered by mouth. That is, that is why the term uh, we coined was peptide in a pill through the unique uh, scientific uh, laboratory from Novo Nordisk. And then, of course, we look at how this upstream approach will which will help our patients with diabetes. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you look at this diabetes, as I mentioned, that about two thirds of our patients in India have obesity. And that is uh, our uh, obese and one in 10 have diabetes. Okay, and what is the risk of, so what is the cost of diabetes you pay? Your cost is you have a seven time increased risk of all cause mortality in their productive age of your life is 51 to 61 compared to people of normal weight without diabetes. So it is a life threatening condition. It's a killer and we call it, it's a silent killer. Um, so, but you know, Indians, some of them happen to look thin. So that is why this term was coined the thin fat India. So if you look at the BMI criteria, a lot of them will fall into the normal weight category. Of course, I'm sure you're aware that the BMI cutoffs for uh, men and um, women in the Indian and Asian population is much less than in the Caucasian population. So we have increased abdominal fat or adiposity and adipose tissue, uh, which uh, we had a concept you know, a few decades ago is silent, something which gives you or uh, when you need reserves, but is now found to be the, a very highly active an endocrine organ which produces a lot of cytokines and it is responsible for the inflammation, the inflammation of the blood vessels throughout your body and is a leading cause of atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, uh, and a high degree of morbidity and mortality. Next slide, please. So let's look at this synergism. So we look at um, uh, adip uh, adiposity, which is adipopathology. So adipopathy, it's called, so it uh, is uh, uh, caused by physical environment, that is your food, your physical activity, alcohol, sedentary lifestyle. And then 
Uh, we can, and this, what does it cause? It causes, as we saw, it promotes <clears throat> two core defects in type diabetes, which is what you need. You have insulin resistance with beta cell decompensation. Uh, this also adiposity causes um, what we call sleep disorders or OSA or obstructive sleep apnea, which has its own morbidity and mortality associated. And then it also causes you to, to, to have an inability to be active. And then uh, it can also lead to uh, impaired mental health. All these will uh, lead to a uh, change in the social environment. Okay, uh, it can be promoted by um, in some equality, and these will all lead to type two diabetes. And diabetes itself can go back and worsen the uh, uh, adipose pathology. Uh, it can be medicated by um, certain medicines uh, which we are using for some time, which have become less popular now for weight producing medications of diabetes, like uh, the particularly like glutazone. The neuropathy and decreased activity can uh, help the uh, weight gain and uh, adiposity. Hypoglycemia and what we call defensive snacking and stimulation of food intake. And then it can lead to stigma and impaired mental health. Next slide, please. So what are the complications due to increased body weight? So it can be a cardiovascular complication or it can be a non-cardiovascular complication. So cardiovascular, you have cerebrovascular disease, you have cardiovascular disease, you have peripheral arterial disease. And then a non-cardiovascular, you have a whole list of things like depression, hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceride, or weight and osteoarthritis, OSA, depression, GRD, you know, urinary stress incontinence, Liver abnormalities, NASH, and NFLD. So you can see the entire body, almost from the head to foot, is being um, uh, affected by this um, increased body weight. Next slide, please. So let's just look what this is this upstream approach. So in the upstream approach, we're trying to address this obesity, okay, rather than a downstream approach, because obesity causes these complications, which I've just mentioned. In, um, uh, few slides ago, leading to hyperglycemia and uh, aggravating the micro and macrovascular complication. But what are we trying to do? Well, by what we are trying to have a downstream approach by trying to control the hyperglycemia. So we need to move up the ladder. So we move to go sort of more upstream and try to treat this obesity and adiposity. Next slide, please. So let's look at the importance of this upstream approach, okay? It should be a weight-centric approach. And what does it do? It dips, disrupts the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes and reverses or slows down the course of the disease, as will be explained in the next few slides. What is the benefit of this? It causes concomitant benefits on cardiovascular benefits, so macrovascular complications and, uh, are prevented and prevents microvascular complications as well. Next slide, please. So if you look at this slide, this is a uh, slide from the Diabetes Prevention Program, in, uh, which has been um, um, very, uh, uh, again, a landmark study in preventing um, type 2 diabetes in our patients with pre-diabetes. And as you can see over here, the rate of incidence of diabetes gradually comes down the more you change the body weight. The, the more your body weight is changed as minus 5 or minus 10, 10 or minus 15 kilograms from your baseline weight, you can see the incidence of type 2 diabetes significantly reduces. Next slide, please. If you look at other studies which have been recently published, okay, for starting with the um, um, look ahead study that is action for health in diabetes, again, you can see that the change in age you and see, if you look at the weight category, if you've got a, a weight reduction of more than 15% of your uh, basal body weight, it, it is uh, uh, H1C comes down to around 1%. If you're looking at the fasting sugar, also it is significantly reduced. And if you look at this slide very carefully, even a moderate weight loss will improve glycemic parameters. And the degree of H1C and fasting um, blood sugar was proportional to the magnitude of the weight loss. Next slide, please. So what is this weight loss? Weight is, this is weight loss. Is it a muscle loss or is it fat loss? So let's you look at that. Um, in the next few slides. So this is a very important landmark study came in, which came out in 2019. It's a direct trial. It is a 
diabetes remission clinical trial. This is the first trial which looked at really um, that diabetes can be reversed. So we're trying to, to uh, from the diabetes prevention program, we're now trying to reverse the diabetes. And you can see over here, uh, starting with the um, slide on the left-hand side, below five kg weight loss, and you compare it more than 15 kilo weight loss, you can see there's a tremendous difference within these two groups. And about 46% of the uh, people in the intervention group achieved their type 2 diabetes remission. So greater the weight loss, the more proportion of the patients going to remain remission. Now, the, whether the remission is transient or long-term, okay, we have now short data up to two or three years where they showed, okay, there is a, uh, some, about 5 to 10% of patients may revert back. But, but if you maintain that weight loss, probably uh, uh, when uh, over the next few years, when we have more data, we'll be really able to tell you whether this um, reversal is permanent or not. So we have evidence-based approaches for weight management. Of course, lifetime, something which we tell all our patients um, and, and uh, which most of them don't do, but the ones who do do these um, lifestyle changes have a tremendous impact on their lives, on their diabetic control, on their complications. And then we have pharmacotherapy, which is listed over here. Uh, we'll be discussing about oral semaglutide um, uh, in the next few slides. Uh, injectable uh, semaglutide was available, but oral is now available in India. And then we have the bariatric surgery, okay, which is you know various types of surgery. We won't go into the details of that uh, in, in this talk. Next slide, please. So what are the unmet needs in weight loss therapy? Okay, we, the weight loss has to be sustained. So we have to see whether weight loss is sustained over a period of time, over six months, one year, two years, or probably more than that. The quality of the weight loss, does it, is the weight loss more related to fat tissue than other um, tissues of the body? And what is the effect of concomitant antidiabetic? Uh, drugs. Next slide. So let us see, uh, let us look at a molecule which will address this um, um, need gap. Next slide, please. So GLP um, um, uh, receptor agonists, I'm sure you've heard about them. They will be available uh, for almost a decade now. They were mostly injectable. Initially, they were twice a day, then they become once a day, and even weekly GLP-1 injections are available. And the GLP-1 receptor agonist is called glucagon-like polypeptide, okay? They have multiple benefits, okay? Uh, starting uh, from the top, we can see weight, uh, weight loss is uh, produced. It has CV benefits. It has tolerable side effects. It is approved for a variety of patients, whether they are diabetic or not. Uh, it causes minimal hyperglycemia, benefits on the cardiovascular um, system and, uh, and the um, uh, blood pressure. Next slide, please. Next, uh, so what, so I, I don't go into the uh, details of this complex slide, but basically to say that there are several primary and secondary brain activation pathways induced by semaglutide. Okay, as you can see on the right hand side, there is activation of the hindbrain. Okay, and there is direct activation of the hypothalamus. So semaglutide induces a secondary neuron response in the um, area uh, prothrimus. Uh, stimulation and the, and also through the nucleus tractus solitarius. So it's a, both a direct through the um, hypothalamus as well as indirect mechanism act, action. Next slide, please. So it is the first agent in our patients with type diabetes which, uh, which um, addresses satiety or hunger. So that is important because most of our patients with type 2 diabetes tend to overeat, and most of them will come and say, Doctor, we are hungry all the time. So this is one of the agents which will definitely address this uh, problem. So if you look at oral semaglutide, what are the changes from the baseline in the body weight, as well as the body composition, as well as the waist circumference, which is an indicator of insulin resistance in our patients with type 2 diabetes. So you can see compared to placebo, body weight loss was an average 2.7 kilograms, whole body weight fat mass reduced by 2.6 kilograms, but if you look at the whole body lean mass, only reduced by 0.1 kilograms. So this is important. So the 
fat percentage loss is about 2%, base circumference loss in centimeters about minus 2.4 um, compared to placebo. So uh, you can see that more fat was lost with oral cyanobutide than with uh, lean mass. The weight loss was mostly caused by reduction in energy intake since the resting beta, uh, metabolic rate was not increased by semaglutide, and the reduction in energy intake was observed both during and after body weight loss. And, and I, I'm sure you know there are counter mechanisms which take care, which try to over, overcome this. But in spite of this, there was a significant body weight loss. And you can see that this is the average body weight loss. So a lot of your patients would lose 5, 10, even 15 kilos. Uh, of their body weight, or if you're looking at percentage, 5, 10, or 15 percent of their body weight uh, will be lost. Next slide, please. Next one. So, the, this is a series of studies with semaglutides. These are called the Pioneer uh, series of studies. And you can see over here a proportion of patients at 26 weeks, that means at about six months, achieving their targets for A1C of below 7 percent. Eight out of 10 people on this semaglutide would uh, do, um, reduce the A1C below 7%. And you can see the different bars. The light um, green is a semaglutide, 3 milligram. 7 milligram is the next dose, which is blue. And deep blue is a 14 milligram. I'm sure you're aware that it is available as 3, 7, and 14 milligram. And we gradually uptitled the dose on a monthly basis and tried to uh, get our patients to the <clears throat> oral semaglutide, 14 milligram. And we look at weight loss more than 5%, about 50% of them, you can see 44% uh, of them on oral semaglutide, 14 milligram will, will, will give the, your patients a lot of benefit. Next slide, please. You will look at another study, which is a pine age study. And as, as we were discussing about uh, sustainability, whether this weight loss is sustained over six months or one year. And this is data from the Pioneer 8 study. We can see that with oral semaglutide, 14 milligram, 41%, and 49% at week 52 maintained a, a weight loss of more than 5%, which is uh, statistically significant. Next slide, please. So this is an impressive uh, body weight loss with this um, oral uh, agent. If looking at the change in the body weight at the end of treatment in the various studies, Pioneer 1 to Pioneer 8, at between 26 and uh, 52 weeks, you can see that up to 5 kg weight loss was seen in the Pioneer clinical trials. You know, at, at difference, whether it's monotherapy or versus an SGL2 inhibitor like empagliflozin or, or, or a DP4 inhibitor like citagliptin or an injectable GLP-1 like liraglutide, even in patients with Redland problems, okay, or those on insulin. Next slide, please. We we'll look at some other um, um, pioneer studies, pioneer two to four and eight to ten. Again, there's a sustained change in the body weight over uh, 26 and uh, 52 weeks, even up to 78 weeks, and it showed that the agent, the oral semaglutide, showed a consistent weight loss, okay, over that. Uh, period of 52, even up to 78 weeks. Next slide, please. Again, this is a busy, busy slide. Again, showing you that the summary of this slide, there's a consistent weight loss, which is regardless of age, because you might think a young person might lose more elderly, who is less active might lose less. But if you look at the uh, age of the patient, below 45, 45 to 65 or more, in 65, there's a consistent weight loss regardless of the age of the patients. Next slide, please. If you look at your change in the body weight by background medication, whether the patient is only on metformin or SUN metformin or as SGL3 inhibitor plus metformin, okay, or even on uh, insulin, you can see there's again a consistent weight loss uh, regardless of the background medication. Because you might feel people on insulin would um, or, or salpinera would lose less weight, but that was not shown in these studies. So it was a consistent weight loss, irrespective of the background medication. Next slide, please. If you look at the change in the AG1C, 
which is a primary endpoint in the various pioneer studies, 3, 7, and 14 milligram of semaglutide compared to placebo or head-on with drugs like empagliflozin or cetaglutide or, um, uh, or, uh, or liraglutide, okay? And you can see up to 1.5% reduction is seen in the pioneer clinical trials uh, in, in the study. So therefore, in the ADA 2022 standards of care, you can see GLP-1, if you look at the left-hand column, okay, um, that is patients with uh, the various guidelines have now said, don't look at the agency alone when you're treating a patient with type 2 diabetes. Look at the comorbidity conditions, this cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, renal complications, or heart failure. And uh, you can see in all of these, GLP ones uh, comes uh, right on top. Particularly if you're looking at ASCVD, it is right at the top over there. Okay, if you're looking at CKD also, it comes next to an SGLT inhibit. Next slide, please. So let's look at this um, gentleman. Um, we uh, had a lot of information um, um, about this molecule called um, semaglutide. And uh, we look at this gentleman, he's 46 year old male. The software engineer. Uh, he's currently on the typical medication which most of our patients with type 2 diabetes will get a metformin and a salpinuria. He has a family history of mother uh, being diagnosed at 46. Father passed away from a heart attack. He's married with two children. He has a sedentary lifestyle and uh, often eats sugary snacks. And no wonder his age is 8.1%. His BMI is Raise is is in the obese category. If you look at the BMI, his body weight is 88 kilograms. Blood pressure 140 to 85. Uh, lipids uh, LDL is just above the um, normal limit, which we would uh, like to have this patient definitely below 100. And the EGFR is um, adequate at 90. His urine albumin pressure ratio is normal at below 30. Next slide, please. So. Let's look at what this gentleman um, uh, um, had been done. So he had what we call a downstream approach because our physicians were trying to control his blood sugar with a, a sulfonyl and a metformin. So if this happens, what would have uh, what is going to happen to this patient? So this patient diagnosed with type diabetes initially the metformin and diet and exercise. Next slide, please. And there is progression of type 2 diabetes with multiple factor. And it is not only are we trying to control his blood sugar, we are trying to prevent his complications, both micro as well as macrovascular. Next one. So what ha is happening to this patient after being on sulfonyl and metformin for three years? He's now being motivated to walk two to three times a week for 20 minutes. He's trying to follow a healthy diet. He's on metformin 1,000 twice a day, and, um, um, and uh, um, but you can see his age one c is gradually rising, has not made any impact. His sedentary lives and erratic food habits made it difficult to achieve uh, glycemic control with ongoing therapy. And what are the patients concerned? He's concerned over atherosclerosis um, because he has shortness of breath and fatigue over the last six months. He's had hypoglycemic episodes from sulfonylurea. And he had weight gain. His father passed away from um, a heart attack at the age of 57. Next slide. So he's at a higher risk of getting macrovascular complications. And in three years, what has happened to his A1C? No improvement. In fact, it's worsened. His BMI has worsened from 30 to 31. Body weight from 88 to 91. Blood pressure from 140 to 85 by 147 to 90. Total cholesterol 189 to 187. LDL. 103 to 107. Uh, EGFR has remained stable. Has uh, uh, UACR and urine and infant ratio has increased from below 30 to now in the um, um, uh, grade one category, which is 40. Next slide, please. So you can see over here, this is his uh, AGUNC curve, okay, 8.1, 7.8 at one year, two years, eight. And this is a typical. Uh, AGUNC curve of your patients if you're using only a drug like metformin or maybe uh, sulfonylurea, but not using any upstream drugs 
we should tackle the basic pathophysiology of the of the um, type two diabetes. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, if you start at three years, supposing this patient was started uh, um, at uh, year three on a GLP one receptagonist along with the statin, you can see his A1C is coming down from eight point three to seven to six point eight, and is stabilized over the next two years on, on uh, at six point eight. Next slide, please. And what has ha happened to his other parameters apart from his improvement in A1C 6.8? His BMI has dropped from 31 to 28.3, body weight 91 to 78, blood pressure has improved from 147.90 to 137.86, uh, lipids have improved, of course, he's on a statin, 197 to 153, LDL 107 to 92, EGFR has not changed, and is urine albumin creatinine ratio has once again come down below 30 milligram per gram. Next slide, please. So, um, uh, so we need to move from what he was having a downstream approach to an upstream approach. Next slide, please. So, if we had um, treated him uh, much earlier, not not three years ago, but probably probably right at the beginning or within the first few years of his uh, life with type 2 diabetes, you would have got all these benefits at a much earlier stage and, and prevented cardiovascular and further complications. Remember that the first year of your life with type 2 diabetes, for every 1% increase in your HbA1c above your target, your risk for cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, is goes up between 50 to 70%. So this, these are very high, you know, scary um, figures. And I think this is what needs to be impressed with our patients and with the physicians start early, strike hard, and make sure the patient reaches targets as soon as possible within the first six months or one year of the uh, diagnosis with type 2 diabetes. Next slide, please. So looking back, of course, uh, had appropriate measures be taken as what I was saying, you could have prevented these cardiovascular complications and other long-term complications. So he continued, um, this if patients continues with this upstream approach of oral semaglutide in the long term. It may be an expensive molecule to start at the very beginning, but you know, uh, remember type 2 diabetes, this is it, to treat type 2 diabetes, it is not expensive because of complications as a lot of uh, the physicians in the audience, cardiologists and um, nephrologists in the audience will realize that uh, the complications are 10 times to 100 times costlier than treating the, uh, the disease itself with modern expensive drugs, which will tackle the basic pathophysiology of patients with type 2 diabetes and prevent cardiovascular and microvascular complications. Next slide, please. So to summarize, the global and the national burden of type 2 diabetes is increasing. And I'm sure you're aware now, India has crossed China as now the leading um, um, country as far as um, the numbers of type 2 diabetes are concerned. And it is complicated by inadequate control and multiple comorbidities. Diabetes with this high body weight insulin resistance, okay, is an emerging syndemic leading to adverse patient outcomes. So we need to adopt a upstream approach towards weight management in patients with type 2 diabetes, and that can lead to multiple clinical benefits, okay? And um, there are, multiple challenges in patients when we are treating a patient with type 2 diabetes. And we have various uh, overarching benefits beyond A1C controls, okay? Uh, particularly if you're using these agents in the upstream. So uh, I'm sure you are aware that uh, a lot of our uh, cardiologists are mentioning about drugs like SL2 inhibitors. So these drugs have actually changed the scenario. They were anti-diabetic drugs when they were first launched. But in the next 10 years, they have become cardiovascular drugs, they become nephrology drugs, they have become drugs of choice for uh, NAFLD and whatnot uh, and, and beyond. So I think we need to uh, uh, review our patients' medications, particularly when they come to at a very young age and that, that too along with uh, obesity. So thank you very much for your patient hearing and, and um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Manojitha, for an excellent deliberation. Basically, what is very important, and this is one of the things which we have all got to realize, 
that management of obesity and diabetes together is like a test match. It's not a T20 match. What happens most of the time when people start treating the obesity, they start doing the exercise uh, or uh, doing the lifestyle measures for a few months, and afterwards they get bored about it and they give up. And that is where the entire battle is lost. Because if we have to have a proper treatment of diabetes, as a new name of this combination of diabetes and obesity is concerned, there has to be a sustained effort. And the sustained effort comes in the form of sustained exercise, sustained um, uh, lifestyle, sustained diets, and also the use of the right medicines. And I'm glad to say that right now in the form of oral semaglutide, we have got a medicine, which although a bit costly, is one of the very effective ways which addresses this twin problem of diabetes and obesity together. Because uh, if you look at the other issues, for example, sustainability of exercise, I'm sorry to say the sustainability of exercise is somewhat very difficult to attain because we did one study that was published in 2018, which showed that only 85% of the patients, uh, if you do not tell them to do an exercise, they will simply not do an exercise. And even if you tell them, only 57% patients would continue with the exercise, which means that exercise, ordering, continuing the exercise, as a long-term measure is sometimes difficult in patients with diabetes and obesity. And what happens most of the time, what we have seen, which I am pretty sure Manojit will also agree to that, that most of the time what happens, the patients, they start the exercise and after some time they lose the interest because they find it very tiring. The advantage of adding a semaglutide to the treatment regime is that the patients start losing weight. As soon as the patient starts losing weight, the patient becomes more enthusiastic about uh, further continuation of these exercise programs because he finds it much easier to do the exercise because his body bulk has gone down. So that is the reason why a combination therapy with a proper diet, proper exercise, and agents like oral semaglutide have actually fitted in the bill. Yes, there is a cost factor. Semaglutide is costly. The monthly cost comes to around 8,000 rupees. But if you look at this from a different angle, for example, the cost of the complications of untreated obesity and diabetes, in that situation, it becomes very difficult to really um, address these issues altogether. And the treatment of the complications can be much more than the treatment of semaglutide. So obviously, mm, uh, with that bit, I'd like to invite any questions, if there's any from the audience regarding this wonderful molecule, which has been launched into the Indian market about a year ago. Ask the general question in, in respect that uh, whatever one do this drug is doing, I personally haven't, you know, no first-hand experience, but uh, what about the measurement of insulin resistance and or insulin fasting and prostandial? Is there any relevance to the treatment of diabetes and obesity as such? Uh, would uh, like to on, on, yes, on a routine day-to-day -day basis, uh, we don't use it. We have uh, better uh, sort of very similar clinical parameters to do it. Uh, firstly, these tests are expensive, and if it's not done in the right laboratory, the results are not reliable. Uh, it is mostly done in a research laboratory setting. Um, we have used other parameters of insulin resistance, like um, abdominal obesity, uh, BMI. Um, we can have uh, other me measures of uh, uh, to measure the liver fat. So these. Uh, or even the pancreatic fat, but these are non-invasive techniques and they are much easier to do and, and they're more reliable. So, but uh, clinically we use the uh, abdominal obesity and we have the cutoffs for that and the BMI, which uh, gives us a idea of uh, insulin resistance. And then of course, if the patient has other parameters like hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, um, uh, uh, polycystic ovaries. So these are also markers Acanthosis nickel. So we have a lot of clinical markers which actually will tell us that the patient is insulin resistance um, without actually uh, working out those uh, figures. Uh, and just and just to add to what Monojit has said uh, in response to Dr. Ray's question, there have been studies done on the laboratory level which looked at the specific markers of insulin resistance, like the HOMA IR, and they found out that this HOMA IR is actually reduced with semaglutide treatment. But that was done on a laboratory basis. This is something which you cannot replicate, as Monojit does rightly say, in the day to day clinical scenario. Question is actually that yes, it is a very expensive test, but if the patient can afford it, is it not relevant to do it at all? 
because it's maybe one time egg test to see what the status is as far as insulin resistance, which is quite variable from one person to another. Yeah. No, we, we can do it, but as I, as I what I've said is we don't do it on a routine basis. You can choose your patients uh, if the patient can afford it and you feel the patient is in, insulin resistant, you can definitely uh, do a one-time test, sure. Any other questions? I think there's some questions in the chat box. Deepika, there's a uh, Deepika question. Sh uh, Shujai, do you want me to read it out? Or you want to it? There's one oh, in the I, Q &A. I, I'm sorry, I cannot see the question here. Uh, uh, Dr. Deepika, it is asking, uh, are the endocrinologists now doing ultrasound upper urban to look at liver fat for insulin resistance and also obese and diabetic patients? Uh, uh, we are not doing it routinely, but we are definitely doing more than what we were doing maybe even two or three years ago, because as you are aware, NAFLD uh, is, is a very important complication of insulin resistance. Um, and uh, we are um, um, so, but having said that, majority of the patients already have an ultrasound for some other reason or not. And they, uh, you always have a ultrasound in hand for most of our patients, whether we've asked for it or not. But uh, I don't do it routinely, but I go by clinical parameters. Of course, if the patient has uh, abnormal liver function tests and uh, patient is, uh, is uh, overweight, uh, you can definitely look for um, um, a routine ultrasound. But I think the uh, just a, um, uh, NFLD, the fat in the liver, the excess fat in the liver is not the only criteria. There are other um, uh, clinical criteria which you need to look at. Um, Shuja, do you do it routinely? Well, not routinely, but in most of my patients, I do it for two reasons. First of all, uh, particularly if the patient is on a GLP-1 receptor analog, because there have been two things. First of all, uh, these two classes of molecules, the GLP-1 receptor analogs, and the SGLT2 inhibitors both have been shown to reduce the hepatic fat content as well as the pancreatic fat content. And this is something which is established now. In fact, I'm uh, seriously contemplating of doing one study on this, uh, basically to, to have the effect of the oral GLP-1 analog on the uh, NAFLD. There have been studies, not very big studies, but I would like to see whether there's anything going on in the Indian space. But the other important issue is why I do an ultrasound is because GLP-1 analogs has been shown to increase the cholelithiasis or the lith lithogenicity of the bile. So that is another reason why, and some of these patients who are on GLP-1 analogs, I tend to do an ultrasound just to see whether they have got any gall stones or something like that. Because in that case, that would be a relative contraindication to continue the GLP-1 treatment. Not an absolute contraindication, though. Taking it's a relative contraindication. Taking lead from Deepika's question and referring to her previous talk, I think as we emphasized, we felt that uh, because nowadays NAFLD is the major cause of morbidity and even mortality. So wh what is the harm in doing a routine ultrasound examination a change our habits? I think I personally do that to every patient who will come with GI problem. But now with the diabetes being our, most of our patients that I, I see have diabetes or pre-diabetes. So I suppose it's not an expensive test not to do it. But I think it would get yield more than not doing it. I agree fully. I mean, as I told you, in the in the vast majority of patients, I do it. Uh, but again, not maybe in each and every one. But obviously, nowadays, we have got a big scoring system by which you can find out the FIB4 scoring, by which you can find out whether the patient has got an NFLD. And if that patient particularly has got a high risk value for the FIB, with the FIB4, I would probably go for doing an ultrasound straight away. You mean, you mean there are a fibro scan? No, no, no. Um, uh, well, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll probably go for, for the fibro scan straight away if the FIB4 okay. values are, are raised. Well, if, I, if the ultrasound is a screening test for referring patients to fibro scan, probably that's the first step in the right direction. Right, like uh, before doing an. That's true, but nowadays we have got other screening systems by which you can uh, diagnose an AFLD. Like the PEEP4, as I mentioned, there are other systems by which you can simply by simple blood tests, like the platelet count, the ALT, AST ratio, and all these things you can find whether the patient is at a risk. But yes, I agree fully. As I told you, I mean, we do ultrasounds quite frequently in diabetes patients. At least I do them. Uh, sometimes as a part of uh, the overall, not only upper abdomen, but also the lower abdomen, uh, just to find out whether the patient has got any renal problems, like any nephrolithiasis or anything wrong with the kidneys. 
So ultrasound of the abdomen, I should say, it uh, is done quite frequently in my in my practice. But as I mentioned, maybe not in all. Right. Yes, Dr. Gopalka, I think has got a question. Hello. Uh, in my practice, I prefer to do ultrasound almost all the patients. Because recently I had two patients who presented with hypoglycemia in diabetes, their diabetes control suddenly extremely improved and they started getting recurrent hypoglycemia. And both of these patients had an AFLD, which was missed for a long time. So I personally believe that all the patients should have their ultrasound done and if required, fibro scan done. I fully agree with what you're saying. In fact, the diabetic NFLDs have got a worse score for a worse oh. prognosis than uh, oh. a non-diabetic NFLD. That's true. And NFLD, NFLD is the cause of liver failure in 50, more than 50% of cases in US. Yeah. That's true. That's very true. Deepika probably wanted to ask something, some questions. Yes, I was just wondering, one moment. Something is just, uh, why has my screen become small? One moment. My screen has become small for some reason. Yeah. No, no, what I was thinking is, I, I just came back from a conference from Delhi yesterday and I was panelist on one of the cases where the patient was obese, diabetic, uh, hemoglobin A1C was uh, controlled, like 6.7. And uh, even uh, lipids were controlled and the patient on FibroScan actually had um, a, a F3 or above and, uh, you know, steatosis was at least S3, 106 kilos. So we actually discussed this case for like 45, 50 minutes. And what came out was that you can have a you know normal liver function test. You can have everything right for the patient, and still the patient has significant fibrosis, you know, pre-serotic basically. So I think Absolutely. the stress Absolutely. we have yeah. put for the patient is going on a low calorie diet and exercising is so important apart from the medicines, which we have to spend time and you know because whatever amount of medicines we give, unless the patient loses weight the fibrosis will not become better and the you know steatosis is not going to become better i mean absolutely. i i had to actually absolutely. talk about GL, glp1 you know uh, receptor agonist and sglt uh, inhibitors and all we talked about all that but see with uh, you know very high doses of semaglutide and all patients cannot tolerate they get a lot of gi symptoms you know bloating and especially vomiting even with the oral ones only the injectable ones work once a week to help to lose weight uh, oral ones, everybody, I've seen a lot of patients stopping it because of, uh, you know, side effects. So the stress we have to put if the patient has, if the patient knows they have pre liver or a lot of uh, significant fibrosis, they'll probably become more serious about losing weight. Otherwise, they don't listen. I mean, they'll come to you every weekend, they'll smile and say, I, I've not been able to lose weight, I did not get time or, you know, I've been eating too much and, you know, all this rubbish. So the amount of stress we can put if we have a fibro scan where the readings are not very good. And that also helps your diabetic control. Now, if they start working out or losing weight and they go on a hypocaloric diet. So that's, I mean, yesterday, the entire day in Delhi was spent on NAFLD patients and NASH and all that. So that is what I was thinking that, you know, we actually, if we do a fibro scan earlier than later, and they were saying, if you only do FIF4 or RAPD is not good. You have to calculate all the uh, NFLD fibrosis score, FIF4 and uh, APRI, and combine all three and decide whether you want to do a fibro scan. So ultrasound has to be done before if your patient is obese and yes. diabetes is not controlled. That means, I, Dr. I, I Bittiga, agree you, with what you're you saying. want I to say that better we should screen the patients at the stage of steatosis rather than the patient going into steatohepatitis and yes. thereby the frank cirrhosis. Absolutely. Yeah, but you can even you have to at least yeah. do the ultrasound earlier and do the fibro scan if your three scores are not good. So yesterday's case was Absolutely. a take-home message for all of us that your patient can present in simple steatosis without having an evidence of steatohepatitis. So it's yeah. a right time screening where you can make the lifestyle intervention and prevent the patient from going into it. So, so it's good that we can compel the patient that start early, hit early, make the lifestyle modification, uh, try to lose weight deliberately rather than going into cirrhosis and then uh, un and then deliberate weight reduction will happen. So the choice is yours. I always ask you uh, what is uh, what is going to happen if I don't do anything about about the fat in the liver so the yeah. liver, uh, normal liver function test all the patients will get scared about but many times what happens is they have normal uh, liver function test 
and they still have even this patient yep. where i was a panelist the liver your even the diabetes was well controlled by the yep. medicines the patient was taking because 6.7 is quite well controlled i yeah, mean i didn't yeah. want it below 6.5 but 6.7 was good enough for somebody whose weight was 106 but the fact that even with all these parameters being okay he still had significant fibrosis i mean it was f3 pre cirrhotic so if mm-hmm. now he doesn't do anything about it this patient is going to land up at the age of 45 being cirrhotic in the next few years so in this case um, uh, dr deepika what is your recommendation so would you would like no, to my recommendation is to do a fibro scan earlier than later agreed agreed like do an ultrasound do, in the patient think, when you do you think in such cases you need to have a liver histology done I, we are I think not we, doing. We I are think not doing. Need... My actually, my question was whether we should do a liver biopsy on these patients. Yeah. The problem is such so, a huge problem in the society that you know majority of your patients who are going to be obese and diabetic are going to have fat in the liver that you cannot biopsy every one because see the mo- mo- mortality morbidity is quite high with the liver biopsy. Agree, agree. agree. I, I'll tell you the reason why. So you can cannot go on biopsying everybody. Can I add something here? I think. this patient should be sent for gastric surgery he should be immediately sent for gastric surgery no yeah. the yeah. bariatric surgery no 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 we are not doing bariatric surgery in everybody nowadays no, bariatric somebody, surgery somebody who is about 120 kg and no, no, you don't do bariatric surgery on them till we have tried intervention yes. lifestyle intervention no, no. for at least 6 to 8 months you, you don't think that life surgery intervention has been tried in that patient no it has not been tried Oh, so great. after we try and you uh, you find out that the you are not succeeding at all, then you can think about bariatric surgery. But I would not send the patient in the first instance without doing anything. No, no, no. I would have thought that the patient who presented to you had already had the lifestyle no, no, intervention no. trial. No, no. No, I, I got what the what, 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 what the sir okay. wants to convey is. supposing if you would have done a liver histology and if still would have found there is a time when the patient is not able to comply with the lifestyle modification and deliberately lose the weight so the early intervention by subject him him for the bariatric surgery could prevent him from going into the frank cirrhosis and the end yes, but failure. you can even put in a balloon nowadays endoscopically in the tummy in the uh, stomach to prevent the food intake you know you can do that even endoscopically you don't have to do surgical bariatric surgery Yeah, in yeah, fact yeah. A, a month ago yeah. i attended a yeah. uh, you know a live endoscopy workshop yeah. in aig hyderabad where they can do everything endoscopically mm-hmm. and even reverse it back later on with putting balloons and this and that mm-hmm. which you cannot reverse with bariatric surgery once bariatric surgery is done it's done it's like irreversible uh dipika so i think i'm not going to get dipika, so over enthusiastic in a 45 year old and do something which is going to be irreversible mm-hmm. in his life because there are a lot of complications of bariatric surgery and everybody yeah, does not use the targeted amount of weight right now mm-hmm. nowadays for the diabetic patients most of the time i mean uh, there is a, there are some very clear cut guidelines on which patients you should do bariatric surgery and absolutely and the guideline says that if you have got diabetes with obesity then mm-hmm. if your bmi is more than 35 you are an ideal case for bariatric surgery Right. Or a diabetic patient, the correct upper uh, upper BMI is something more than forty. But that is not the issue here. The issue is that, as you rightly mentioned, nowadays most of the bariatric surgeons you don't, we do not go for the Roux and Y because Roux and Y is a very mutilating surgery. We do not go for that. It's a simple, I should say, endoscopic, uh, you know, putting in Balloon one of those little balloons, as we say. That is what is done in most of the bariatric surgery patients, and that is something yes. which cuts down. the food intake because the problem with most of the diabetic patients particularly the obese diabetes and this is basically human nature particularly indian nature that if you tell them not to do something <laughs> they'll do exactly the same thing so if you tell the patients to cut down their diet they'll just keep on having that extra diet maybe uh, i mean concealing it from everybody including the family members this is something which we all know so this what this sort of putting in those inflatable stents that you're talking about mm. this is something which is done in all parts of india right now and basically yeah. what it does is simply cuts down your food intake that's a simple yes, thing absolutely. it does not have the effect that we are talking about like when you're doing a ru and y you basically have an effect on the enterocomorphin cells so you take them out so what is known as the your uh, in the when you're doing so the gastric uh, gastric bariatric surgery the area is like really so jayada i'm just going to uh, you know interrupt in the middle they can actually put these and uh, endoscopically these tubes endoscopically so that in the duodenum the food is not stored and the food just bypasses and goes to the tube so that it's not stored nowadays they're doing yeah. that endoscopically also yeah i know i know i know but what i'm trying to say 
the primary reason why bariatric surgery got so much interest with this blue, blue and white procedures was because it used to get rid of the areas which produce some of these in, uh, some of these endocrine hormones like the yes. PYY, mm. the uh, the ghrelin, and all these ones. They were basically removed. So that's what brought down the appetite, and that is something which was helpful because I remember in 2009 this when I attended this EASD meeting in, in I think it was in Rome. They first presented this data of reversal of diabetes with bariatric mm. surgery. And at that time, this concept came very much into the into the, uh, the concept of discussion that diabetes is a surgically treated uh, reversible disease. Now, obviously, we do not have that view because there have been, uh, these patients have been followed up and a lot of these patients have got a reversal of diabetes, re-reversal of diabetes because there is a very clear-cut definition right now over the last few years of what exactly we, might, we mean by reversal of diabetes. It is that mm. the HbA1c should be less than 5.7 the patient should not be on any medicine at all, at least for one year. That is the definition of reversal of diabetes. So if we cannot achieve that, we cannot say the patient has undergone a reversal. But initially, people thought that, oh, you take out those areas of the stomach and the intestine, and the diabetes is going to completely reverse. Now, that concept has also undergone a change. Uh, regarding the other thing that you said, we fully agree that, as I mentioned, that NAFLD, and particularly the other issue which is coming into our interest right now, is the fatty pancreas. Fatty pancreas is something which has been shown because whenever there is a, uh, a lot of these obese patients who have got a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, they've also got a fatty pancreas. And one of the problems of this fatty pancreas is that there are release of lots of these inflammatory markers from this fat deposited in the pancreas, which has got an adverse action on the beta cells. So that is something which is something with, and there have been studies. There has been a beautiful study published from Olympia Institute of Delhi, which was published in JCM, just about a year ago, which showed an agent like an SGLT2 inhibitor like empagliflozin. It reverses this entire process of uh, fat deposition in the liver and the pancreas and leads to a fantastic improvement in the both the liver functions and the pancreatic functions, including um, the improvement in the diabetes control. So these are the things which are some new concepts which are coming up right now. And particularly with the GLP-1, there has been enough data to suggest that they actually lead to a reduction of this fatty fat content of the liver and could be a very good agent to cut down, uh, to treat the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We, as we all know, we do not have any good agents to control the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's only one agent which has got approval right now, that is the uh, uh, which was, uh, which is one particular agent which has got an FDA approval as a treatment for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. All the others that we use, including the RCD deoxycholic acid, we all know it's utter bullshit because it does not have any sustained action in the sustainability of the reduction of the liver fat. So that is that is that is very well established right now. I, so I this uh, discussion, I think we're probably running out of time. So probably yeah, mm, sure. what I'm saying, uh, I think that Dinesh and I was discussing earlier on that there has been some questions in the other session, which was left un undiscussed. So perhaps uh, we can give 10 minutes of, uh, if, if Dinesh uh, approves that for any other questions to the first two speakers, which was not, yeah, or the full panel can come into being. And uh, I think um, that we can start now. Dinesh, is that okay? Yeah, sure. I think the, the sensation of hypertension and sepsis, is there any other question, any questions um, which need, needs to be answered by the, the speaker as well as the chairpersons? Or any other participant? I actually had. Said, I, ha I have a strong question for Avilash, and that yes. was regarding how how are you going to do the measurement of the autonomic functions in a bedside manner in a patient? Sorry, what? sorry. Autonomic you... functions. You mentioned about uh, uh, the assessment of the. Autonomic uh, functions at the bedside is a simple thing you can tell your patient. In the sitting position at the level of the heart, you measure the blood pressure. And after three minutes, you see there is a drop in the systolic blood pressure over and above 20 mm of mercury, along with the symptoms of uh, giddiness and all those things. It's very simple. Second is, is a Valsalva maneuver where you ask the patient to blow in a syringe and you just try to close it at the other end. And you see the decrease in the heart rate. What we do in the uh, uh, routine practice, RR interval has been calculated. And the third one is the ask the patient to lie down in the bed. 
So at the sitting position, you take a blood pressure. And after the patient lies down in the bed, you just uh, measure the blood pressure. If it goes over and above 20 mm of mercury in supine position. So this is very typical of uh, the autonomic insufficiency or the uh, dysfunction in these group of patients. Now here, one more very simple test. At one point, you can define there is an orthostatic drop in the blood pressure when the patient stands. And what do you expect physiologically? Whenever there is a drop in the blood, blood pressure, there should be a reflex tachycardia. On contrary, these group of patients never have tachycardia, rather they go in bradycardia. So these are the simple markers of the bedside test to, to assess the autonomic uh, dysfunction or instability or what we call cardiac dysautonomia in the patients with type 2 diabetes, long-standing diabetes, and they carry a very high risk of sudden death. So the simple test, we can do it on our routine bedside, uh, you know, uh, by measuring. Yeah, uh, just, just a comment here. I, I, I fully agree with what you have said. The only one comment I'd like to make here is that in a perhaps a routine clinical setting, that R interval that you're talking about, until unless you've got the patient hooked up to an estimation, it's difficult to do that. So yeah. so that's that's one point. But the other ones I fully agree. The postural drop of blood pressure is something which you can certainly measure on the bedside. Uh, but again, regarding the uh, the dysautonomy that you find in the in the cardiac no, dysautonomy that we find in patients with diabetes uh, so basically what one of the important things is that this cardiac autonomy dysautonomy and diabetes has got a different presentation at different times of the day for yeah. example when a, when a dysautonomic event happens at the daytime the sympathetic system predominates when it happens mm -hmm. at night time after midnight it's uh, uh, the parasympathetic system that predominates so that's why, you know, if a patient gets something like a, a sudden bradyarrhythmia and an arrest uh, at nighttime, that is something which can't contribute to the sudden cardiac death because the parasympathetic tone is so high, the patient simply goes into an arrest and uh, even before they realize it's, it's gone. There have been several studies on these, like yeah. the variation of the sympathetic tone throughout the day. There is actually mm -hmm. uh, something known as a, uh, what is it, a circadian variation, circadian rhythm variation. In yeah. Patients, uh, uh, and, and, and different times of the day. And this is very important. Yes. Sir. Even even in, in diabetic, if you speak uh, exclusively as yeah, a I'm diabetic, talking diabetic patient, the yeah. patient may have uh, very early features of, you know, typical the erectile dysfunctions. They have uh, impaired sweating. Even the pupillary reflexes are lost in the very early phases. So by simple bedside test, this can help us to delineate that the patient uh, is going into... Erectile the dysfunction is something which is very difficult to test in a day-to-day -day scenario. Yeah, because yeah, most yeah, of it the is, patients, is, they would is, not it admit is multifactorial. It. it is multifactorial. Beyond one thing, the patient may have multiple pathologies at given time. So uh, the concept also the other thing is very important that in the because you have raised this topic in diabetes, functional hypogonadism as we call it is very yeah. common. So yeah. in fact, we have we have actually published one consensus guideline which is there available in the public domain. But we say that basically around seven, seventy percent of patients with diabetes they suffer from functional hypogonadism at some point of time. But again, most of the time, patients who have got this erectile dysfunction, until mm -hmm. they're very, very popular, uh, they're very familiar, they're very confident with the doctor, they would not divulge the secrets. I have a exactly. patient who are presenting with history of functional hypogonadism after six years of consultation. And he was mm -hmm. having that problem going on at least for the last three to four years. He simply did not have the courage or he felt that it would be very uh, debilitating for him to discuss yeah. this case. So it so happened, I mean, it has happened several times that when they bring in the partner or the spouse, that's the time when this issue comes to the highlight, this erectile dysfunction. Yes. Otherwise, it simply goes unnoticed. Uh, it was imperative on my part to discuss the autonomic dysfunction and the hypertension because it is a very challenging on the part of a physician or the cardiologist or even a diabetologist to manage these group of patients. At one spectrum, you get a hypertension or the other spectrum, postprandial, they go into the plant vasodilation, there's a drop in the blood pressure, and then the elderly frail individual with frequent falls. So on one hand, you have to add a molecule in such a way. For example, the guidelines of whatever I've presented today, they are all A-grade uh, evidences. At one stage, they say that the patient has got an orthostatic hypotension to so try giving a low dose of Lozart and means short acting ERBs. Again, you can add a fluidrocortisone, which can precipitate fluid retention, electrolyte imbalance, and again, the hypertension on the other hand. So practically managing these group of patients who has an established uh, autonomic dysfunctions with an hypertension is really a very big challenge. For a physician, on one hand, he has to uh, maintain the goal. On the other hand, he has to please, avoid the drop questions. in the blood pressure. Can you make it more precise, please, and to the point? Because there may be other questions. We have yeah. only 10 I'm minutes. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. No. Okay. So any other questions?
him. If not, then can I request Dr. Surmit Acharya and Dr. Vinayak Dev to any, have any comments on the hypertension issues? I think uh, none of them are, we may have left already. Um, there were a couple of, uh, there, there, there is one question, a couple of questions raised to me by one of the parties. Few participants may not be here by now, but I can see the number has dropped down quite a lot from the participant, which was 45. So the, there was a question on the, that they didn't ask in that question, but the question was the, regarding the sepsis. And we discussed about uh, the I mean arterial pressure, but regarding the therapy, uh, there hasn't been any clear cut guideline to how to proceed today in acute and chronic uh, with oh, so many so many different types of antibiotics. How do we proceed? What is the up, uh, step up or step down, or what is the choice today? In a the, every year, the resistance okay, more organisms are increasing with anti antibiotics. Please, can you answer, please, both uh, the speaker as well as the chairperson? And I'm not sure whether they're still there. But anyway, uh, it's these questions were raised some time ago, and now it's probably neither of them are in the in the in the loop. Are you there, Doctor? Koshik goes. If, uh, if I'm, not sure, I'm not sure they're there at all at the moment. If so they're I not there, can, can I answer? If they're not there, the speakers are not there, can I answer this question? But they need some sort of guideline today. I have an experience recently. I'm just my telling you because Sir, there's been, yeah. you know, there, there is a the, 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 in ITU they started with the meropenum and there's not much above to go on. So uh, yeah. that's the situation. That also is not working. I'll, I'll just make it quite simple because I've, uh, I've just delivered talk on antimicrobial stewardship program. The first and foremost, the all international guidelines, including WHO, clearly endorses and says that try to select the antibiotic as per the epidemiological data of the geographic region which you practice. Second should be the selection of the organ involved in the management of sepsis. If the patient comes with a urosepsis, try to select an antibiotic which covers a uropathogen. If the patient comes with a GI sepsis, try to select a pathogen which has a good GI penetration. And if the patient has got a pulmonary, cardiac, or central nervous system. I think we all remember in the good olden days, there was an antibiotic which was given based upon above the diaphragm or the below the diaphragm it was working. So based upon the epidemiological data, antibiotic surveillance program, try to select the drug and the organs involved. And the most important thing in the management of the bacterial sepsis, before you try to contemplate or try to obtain or give an antibiotic, the specimen should be obtained for uh, multiple cultures. And after you take a culture, you should not wait for the reports to happen. And based upon the epidemiological data, you should initiate the antibiotic. Every ICU will have their own uh, antibiotic protocol based upon the ICU cultures and the data they have. So start the antibiotic, hit early, hit hard, and uh, we what we call as an early goal directed therapy in the management of sepsis. So here you obtain the pure cultures. Along with it, you should start it. And nevertheless, the culture should not be the random. See, it's not a vague term when we use the word culture. If the patient is coming with an organ transplant or the hematopoietic stem cell transplant or the patient is on immunosuppressive, look at the underlying condition of the patient and based upon which you should tell appropriate culture like aerobic, anaerobic, bactic, bactic plus culture, fungal culture, mycobacterial culture. So all these cultures has to be sent together and then the antibiotic should be started in this group of patients. Meanwhile, you should give the supportive treatment as what has been already discussed in the management of sepsis. I think I'll convey the message if he, if he she is not around. But anyway, uh, I think uh, if there's no other question, uh, then Dinesh, can we conclude with the... Uh, uh, yes, um, I will now request Dr. S.K. Gopalka to uh, please uh, give his closing remarks and vote of thanks. Thank you. Is he not around? Dr. Can I hear? Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, hear you. Am I heard? You, yes, you're audible. Good, yeah, thank you. Good, good evening, everyone. It has been an honor 
to be a part of this very enlightening discussion on so many important topics can you we can hear you yes, sir audible go on yeah on behalf, of, on behalf of on behalf of royal college of physicians of ireland i would like to thank everybody present here as well as the people who are listening to this webinar especially i would like to thank dr roy dr jain our speakers chairpersons and not later at least the sponsors as well thank you very much we had a very fruitful discussion now for the for the day, for the, this this webinar we can say goodbye to each other okay bye for now bye everybody goodbye everybody bye 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 have a nice thank day thank you everybody good day thank bye. you everyone bye bye good good night bye 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 thank you bye bye, bye.